Dr. Stephen Greer is one of the world's authorities on the subject of UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence. He's also written five books and produced four feature-length documentaries, each listed in the description with the link. He's currently working on a documentary about new energy titled The Lost Century and How to Regain It to be released in spring 2023. I'm joined today generously by Dan Zetterstrom of That UFO Podcast. Now, the link to that podcast will be in the description, and I recommend you subscribe. At around the 20-minute and the 40-minute mark, you'll hear an ad for Trade Coffee and Hyundai, respectively, as they both sponsor this video. Thank you and enjoy. If you can see this, type in Spirited Away. Spirited Away. You like your anime references. So, sorry, are you there? Yeah, that's all right. So all everything right. okay? I, I don't know. I Somehow it went over to something called safe driving mode. Okay, well. must mean that it gets rid of the video because they don't want you looking at the video while you're driving. Okay, we'll be unsafe at the desk. Oh yeah, I want to give you some some briefings. So my name's Kurt, and this is a Theories of Everything podcast. It's like a, a physics term, and and I'm interested in the phenomenon. So I interview people on the phenomenon. Okay. Okay. So so welcome, Dr. Greer. I'll give you a great introduction in the edited version. So don't worry, go through your accolades and so on. Welcome, Greer. Sorry, it's Dr. Greer, and there are thousands of people watching right now. Great. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm here in Washington. Okay, so we'll start off slow and then we'll get into the meat of it. And, and just so you know, just uh, let me take this out, but just so you know, I, I, if I feel as if the question is going on, the answer is going on for a bit too long, I mean no disrespect, I may just interject and say, okay, so going back to the original question and so on, because you mm -hmm. have so much knowledge and experience and, and you're, you're, you're voluble and, val and valuable at the same time. So does, does, does that sound fair? Is that all right? Sure. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Great. Okay, so this question comes from Santiago, who wants to know, mm. what's your workout routine and what type of music do you listen to? <laughs> I like alternative rock, uh, mostly the alternative. Uh, and uh, my workout routine is about eight hours a week. I do a lot of uh, mountain biking and hiking in the gym. I, I focus on non-cardio weight, so... You know, I have a, a day that I do chest and day I do back, day I do legs, day I do arms. Each day? And then, no, I, I focus on one muscle group a day. Well, what I mean is you take a day off, like do you have a rest day or each day you do something? Yeah, maybe I'm, yeah, I'm usually one or two days a week I take a break. And then the key thing is, you know, nutrition. Luckily, my wife's a good cook and I like to eat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to alternative rock, just to harp on that, what bands... Well, I, I, there's a new band I like a lot called Spacey Jane. Um, I like AWOL Nation, Cage the Elephants, um, some of the older ones, Foo Fighters, which of course named their band after uh, UFOs. Uh, yeah, see this guitar? That's all I play is alternative rock, but from the mm -hmm. 90s, like Nirvana and Our Lady Peace. Oh yeah, I love those too. Yep, those are great. So that's what I listen to. I just stream it off of one of the sites and um, I don't actually curate my own list, but I have a friend who does for our premieres and events he, he he curates them for us this question comes from andy mcgrillen who says that this podcast right now what we're doing it's been anticipated by thousands of people and you rarely do podcasts so why is it that you're appearing on this one and you feel free to compliment theories of everything as much as you like <laughs> well I, I don't know my people said that it had a lot of viewers and we're trying to get some critical information out about what we're working on coming up in the next uh eight or nine months and uh, that you guys could probably help get the word out and uh, inform some of the public that perhaps I'm not normally reaching. So uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to communicate with you guys. All right. What is it that you're working on in the next few months, mm -hmm. eight, nine months? Well, on October 25th, of course, we're doing a big event in, in Santa Monica and it's a webinar you can join, uh, but it's the backbone of a new documentary feature film. Uh, we anticipate it will be more significant than unacknowledged that has had 760 million people see it. Uh, this next one is going to be called The Lost Century. So we're crowdfunding it also. I mean, in other words, all our, all our activities are the people funding it. We don't have a corporate um, or that type of sponsor because we want to be able to tell the truth and the whole truth and not have it censored by somebody who controls the content. So... The, the lost century film.com is the site if you want to help us with that or you can join us on october 25th the event itself is sold out in person in santa monica 
But what we're doing with that film is to create um, a movement uh, like the disclosure movement, but focus on the technologies that have been sequestered away that would get us off oil and gas and coal. And for that matter, fake electric cars like Tesla's and solar panels and what have you that create a huge amount of pollution and you're plugging your car into the coal fired power grid, right? Or gas fired power grid, say, you know, 88%, not renewable uh, energy from your electricity grid. So there are technologies, some are called zero point or quantum vacuum flux systems <clears throat> that are very well established, I mean, existed, but have been vanished uh, by corrupt interests, both corporate and government. So what we want to do with the lost century is show that there's a lost century, 100 years of these technologies that have been sequestered and the earth is in serious trouble and we're not going to fix it with just drilling more oil or putting solar panels around because the solar panels don't have enough energy density and that both sides are right and wrong about some of the policies they're, they're putting forward. But what they're really missing is this third element, the element being that these really advanced technologies some of which are explain how, for example, the so-called UFOs don't have a payload of fuel uh, or a nuclear reactor. You know, where so they this is tied to the phenomenon. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I always wish when I'm up here in D.C. and if I'm having a meeting with some people uh, critically and, you know, uh, folks who supposedly manage the intelligence community here in Washington, you know, I'll point to that Tic Tac that everyone made such much noise about. And I said, that's an alternative energy and propulsion device. Just think of it that way. You know, don't make this any more esoteric. And in that case, it almost certainly was from the Lockheed Skunk Works. In other words, it was not, quote unquote, uh, an even on board or extraterrestrial. So I think this is, gets into the whole discussion of where have our tax dollars gone? What do we have in classified projects? Um, what part of that can be disclosed so that we could move off of oil and gas and coal? And, uh, and really create a new civilization based on technologies that Nikola Tesla, the real Tesla, uh, and others began to discover back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So we have 100 years where we've lost um, social and I think spiritual evolution with it. And we've trapped the planet environmentally on a downward spiral to a, nearly an extinction level event that's coming out quickly. And the other problem is that half the world's population is in unbelievable poverty. And, you know, in the West, we're so narcissistic. We think, oh, well, we have hundreds of years of oil and gas here in, you know, North America or wherever, or the Middle East, uh, which is probably true. But the biosphere can't withstand hundreds of years more. And that doesn't count. About half the world's population doesn't have electricity. Uh, or a way of life like we do. I mean, 3 billion people don't have any way to cook their, their meals. Uh, they're, they're scrounging and tearing down old growth rainforests or desert plants to cook and make charcoal. That's 3 billion. The economists just came out with that number a few months ago. So if we're really going to live as, as a planet that lives can be at all just, which means it can be peaceful and get to what some people call a level one civilization, we're going to have to really quickly bring these sciences and technologies out. So that's the next big thrust. Of course, it's, at the, it's in the core message of the Disclosure Project. But this entire documentary film will be focused on that. And then we're going to also describe how these technologies have vanished and what we need to change to get them out to the public. Coffee helps me work. It helps me fast from carbs. It's become one of the best parts of my day consistently. That's why I'm delighted that we're collaborating with Trade Coffee. They partner with top independent roasters to freshly roast and send the finest coffee in the country directly to your home on your preferred schedule. This matters to me as I work from home. Their team of experts do all the work testing hundreds of disparate coffees to land on a final curated collection of 450 exceptional coffees. I chose these three and the team at Trade Coffee worked to create a special lineup for theories of everything for the Toe audience based on some questions they asked me such as 
how much caffeine do I enjoy, and what's the bitterness ratio, etc. You can get that lineup, or if that's not, let's say, your cup of coffee, then you can take your own quiz on their website to find a set that matches your specific profile. If you'd like to support small businesses and brew the best cup of coffee you've ever made at home, then it's time to try Trade Coffee. Right now, Trade is offering Toe listeners a total of $30 off your subscription plus free shipping at drinktrade.com slash everything. That's drinktrade.com slash everything for $30 off your subscription to the best coffees in the country. drinktrade.com slash everything. Interesting. Okay, about the technologies that vanish, just so you know, I get people who claim, at least claim that they were inspired by UFOs or they have tapped in just on their own to the same physics that they're operating by and they have some technology and they want to show me but i have this policy of i'm sorry if you can't come public with it like show everyone then don't show it to me because i don't want to have any information that i can't talk about so that's just my own policy i don't like to have to sign an nda or be in possession of anything that i can't talk about and what they tell me is kurt as soon as i go forward with this I will, people have died from this. The government has silenced people and I'm worried for my health, my safety, or I've been contacted by the government officials who are trying to silence me. Mm -hmm. So in other words, those are some fears that people have. Now I'm curious, do you have those fears and how warranted are they? They're very warranted and we can prove that this has happened. I mean, I've been personally involved in teams that have had uh, the result of a wet works group kill its principal people. Wet works is CIE term for wet from blood being killed. And, you know, I've had myself on the watch group list more than once, which is the kill list. But I think that what... But how do you know that? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I just, thoughts occurred to me. So how was it disclosed to you that... Well, you remember, I've starting in 93, I've briefed people like the director of the CIA, and I have a network of people in clandestine services and elsewhere who, uh, you know, who are friendly to what we're doing. They don't want to stick their necks out too far because they don't end up like Bill Colby, the CIA director who was helping us back in the 90s bring one of these technologies out. And they found him floating down here south of D.C. in the in the river. Um, he was wet work. His best friend was a colonel who was on our team and confirmed that that was a kill, but made to look like an accident. So these guys are not without foundation. What they're, they're a huge mistake. And this is a big part of this film. And you're going to hear about this. If you join our podcast on October uh, 25th, there is a strategy to avoid that. But everyone keeps making the same mistakes. And as Einstein said, the you know, definition of insanity is doing the th same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So what we've done is analyzed 120 years or so <clears throat> of these sort of technologies, how they've come and then how they vanished. What are the mistakes that are consistently made? And you named it. You hit the nail on the head. They're trying to keep it secret. Now, you know, what I tell people is that if you have something like that, contact me yesterday um, immediately. And you have to be prepared to open source it. Now, what does open source mean? It's like GitHub, the software company. Um, it means that you release all of it without any holdback to the public, but massively. So what I would do is have a massive press conference around it, but it would have been released, the entire plans, how it operates, nothing held back, forget patenting this stuff, it's going to get seized um, <clears throat> to a national security order, NSO. And so what you have to do is, is say, okay, the, the whole system is set up to intercept these. The big, one of the biggest ones are financial and legal traps. Uh, that are out there because people will take in, quote, investors. The other is that you'll be offered a lot of money, be black shelved. I mean, if it's enough information and knowledge, they'll, they'll try to buy it off and, and put it on a shelf where nobody sees it. Uh, that's, we know of specific cases where that's happened. Well, th that person is rich, the inventor and his team, but, you know, the world's dying, right? Right, so, right, right. So, you know, now there's another way to do this, but it's very against what most venture capital and financial and legal and business people would say. And that is you take all the details of that invention and you release it open source and without any holdbacks, no patent and no For the good of humanity. Yes, but it would also be for the good of the person. I'll get to this in a minute. This is very counterintuitive. And this is where 
you have to, you can have a, a, a hundred million dollars in an operational device, but if you don't strategically understand what you're up against, you're up against an 800 trillion, $900 trillion dollar, uh, cartels of energy, utilities, oil, gas, coal, all of this, uh, the petrodollar system, you're not going to take that on, even if someone gives you a billion dollars, if you don't have the right strategy. So what I explain to people is that what I, what I discovered from working with a number of these groups, beginning with Bruce De Palma in uh, 1991, and subsequently the Tuari device and many others, and the Stan Meyer family that had the car running on water, those were real systems, but they all made the same mistake. They kept the, the uh, technology secret in a small group of people. So I recommend you have to do something called detargeting. How do you detarget yourself? Well, you do what I've done. You get it out there. You put it out there. And uh, that's what I do with the disclosure project. You don't sit on this sort of thing. Um, because if nobody knows, you're the tree that fell in the woods that nobody ever heard, right? So if you don't want to be the tree that falls in the woods, which means another dead body or, or a confiscated technology, you push it out. Now, here's one of the problems. If you're in a lab at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, like a man I know who discovered one of these, a physicist, um, and nobody knows who you are, you don't have the means to get a billion, two billion people aware of it. What my group has developed are groups of influencers and celebrities and others that we would be able to get that out to people and you know, at least a billion to two billion people in a couple of weeks, in a fortnight. So what that means is that you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube so fast and so hard, these fascists can't put it back in. Uh, well, I call them the petrofascists. Sure. How um, do you get it out to, a, let's say, a billion people? How do you do that? What is that, like a newsletter or a video about? Like, this no. is popular. This is a few thousand, but. Mm -hmm. No, for example, you know, there, there, there are people who are very, very supportive of what, what I'm working on, like uh, Demi Lovato and Ariana Grande and. Um, other celebrities. And I, you know, we say, Hey, drop this link to your 150 million followers. And the link will go straight to the plan so that everybody could build one of these who's skilled in the art of electrical engineering. So you have to get it out. Why is that? Because the group that wants to, the, these sort of nefarious covert groups who've been keeping these technologies secret, they're counting on them remaining obscure. And your obscurity is your Achilles heel. If you don't have a billion or two billion people who know about it, and you're not going to get cooperation from the mainstream media because the mainstream media is corrupt um, and will ban it. They will absolutely ban the story on it. Now, of course, you know, we say, well, the mainstream media are ostensibly pro-environmental, not on this. <laughs> I'll tell, I can tell you a very funny story of briefing 120 world leaders in, on an island and the you're the Great Barrier Reef uh, back about uh, nine years ago. And uh, the most hostile person, when I discussed this, I was on a panel with the head of Br British Petroleum and a whole bunch of other people. And the Minister of Defense of Australia was there and a bunch of other world leaders. But the most hostile person out of that 120 person crowd was the head of Greenpeace. <laughs> Because it would be. So this the sounds end. like a dangerous yeah. message. Remember, I'm just a naive, foolish person, so I don't know. So if this is not dangerous, but it sounds like this is extremely dangerous. So how is it that you've protected yourself other than making yourself known to many people? And is mm -hmm. that the same strategy Bob Lazar tried to use? Well, yes, but remember, he was a young man who was only there a few weeks and saw very little um, uh, information about this. I have over 1,100, well over a thousand people like him but who have been involved in much more critical information. So what, what I've had to do is not is have support from inside the system. And so speaking very bluntly back in the nineties, when a number of us were targeted with an electromagnetic weapon, where we were all dropping dead of various cancers. I mean, as you know, I had metastatic malignant melanoma, a congressman we were working with who was digging in the Roswell, uh, had a strange cancer that killed him in six months. And my right-hand assistant was killed and Bill Colby was killed. And I'd had a man come to me every year and say, hey, do you want protection? And I'm, you know, I'm a civilian, never been in the government. I'm a medical trauma doctor, emergency doctor. I said, no, no. But when this happened, I said, make it so. So there's a group that protects us um, that have significant 
countermeasures in, in their capabilities that keep it at a sort of a, used to be called a Mexican standoff. You know, we're basically, you know, we're not being bothered. And that's true of anyone who comes into our group because it extends to the people working with me. Um, and this work, it's held for 20, that was put in place in 98. So it's held for 24 years. Is this a, is this a private group or is it a no, group no, that's affiliated no, no. with the U.S. government? No, this is, well, okay, you have to understand, first of all, we have to define terms. There's two governments. <laughs> there's the U.S. government of the Constitution and the people. And then there's a secret government, as Senator Inouye said. Uh, in that famous uh, talk when he said uh, there is a, a secret government with its own air force, its own Navy, its own funding mechanism that's above the law and free from the law itself. So this gets into some shadowy stuff, right? So, but there are people in, on both ends of those governmental spectrum that are very, very supportive. So like right now I'm in Washington because I'm taking meetings with people who are military officials assigned to the White House and the people who oversee the black budget of the United States and the Congress, that I'm providing the information to the actionable intelligence so that they can penetrate these programs. That's very dangerous. I mean, it's extremely dangerous. But that's happening right now. I mean, that's what, what we're working on right now um, because the Congress passed the law. Now, those guys, when they get when I get them read in, as, as it's called, or briefed on all this, and I onboard them, with all the information we have, because I'll give them information like here's the project code names, here's where they're located, here's the gate, here's the section of this base where there's an underground facility where an extraterrestrial vehicle is being studied, et cetera, and so on. And because of that, because they have the ability to kick doors in, uh, they, they've, hit, they've hit pay dirt in the last six months. This is a big announcement actually, but it's not being reported yet in mainstream media. And hopefully my name stays out of it. Um, but <clears throat> nevertheless, there are groups of people who are very supportive of what we're trying to do and it's taken very seriously. And one part of that group are people who can protect and they do protect. So, and then there's some other ways, I think, <laughs> things that are not quite seen that are protective. But anyway, we, we're, we're, you know, I never would, I would never be so arrogant to say that, you know, I'm sort of an untouchable person. I think it's what we're doing is dangerous, but I accepted the dangers of this back in 92 and 93. You know, it was in, in May of 1992, 30 years ago, that the head of army intelligence, General uh, Stubblebine, uh, Bert, Albert Stubblebine III is what he went by, offered me $2 billion to not talk about this or pursue this. Um, I told him, you know, I'm not for sale. And then he went to my wife, tried to convince my wife. And that was a big mistake on his part because no one does that. Um, but that was 30 years ago. So, I mean, the corrupt, the capability to corrupt people here um, is very high. Who offered that to you? The two billion? The head of uh, the, the general stubble mine. He had been head of army intelligence and special forces and, he was a member of this elite group and intelligence group. Some call it magic. I have a, a, a National Reconnaissance Office document that has magic on it, M-A-J-I-C. It stands for the Majority Intelligence Committee that deals with the UFO and extraterrestrial issue. And it's related subjects, including macroeconomic issues and these technologies. And remember, these technologies that we're going to be exposing in the lost century, and by the way, there are four of them, we would like to feature more that we bar that are operational right now as you and I are speaking, but they are tied up in a strategic plan by the inventor and their investors. That means it'll never see the day of light. They're they're either already dead men walking, or they are so encumbered legally and financially that the public will never get the benefit of them. The only reason I'm going to expose them uh, in this documentary that we're working on. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, please help us do this. Uh, we're, is, is that I think the public needs to know that over the last hundred years, there have been thousands of these breakthroughs. And people say, how can that be? I said, because the laws of the universe are universal. If you're a physicist or a scientist uh, like we are, you know that the laws of the universe are universal. So what does that mean? It means that whatever can be discovered on another star systems, you know, from another star system can be discovered by people on this planet. 
And even, you know, a lot of people look at this uh, sort of anti-gravity, which is a bad term, but gravity control is the proper term. Um, that is tied into the whole zero point energy uh, aspect. That began to be experimentally observed by T. Townsend Brown uh, and others back in the 1920s, where very, very high frequency electromagnetic uh, signals at voltages in the millions of volts, but at low power would cause objects to look like they're levitating. And that was done in the 20s. So these are well documented. Uh, what most people don't know is that October 1954 is when these clandestine projects within the US government mastered gravity control, quote unquote. I'm quoting from a, a redacted uh, top secret document, but my people here in Washington, one of whom was the chief scientist at the Naval Research Labs, who is, of course, the one that it's the biggest Department of Defense lab, and Thomas Edison started it. He, uh, Richard Foch, who's now passed away, he went into the vault where a lot of these documents are kept and saw the document that stated point blank that we mastered gravity control in 1954. And this brings up a big problem in the UFO community and also with the congressional hearings that are happening here. People look at those objects and they think that if it's not a jet fighter or a rocket, because those were all like 30s, 40s era technologies, it has to be, quote unquote, extraterrestrial or alien. I'm going, that's nonsense. Most of what these objects are that people see are from my, my uncle worked for Northrop Grumman his whole career and had worked on the lunar module, landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong in it. Or, and so Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Booz Allen Hamilton and EG&G, and we know who the contractors are and where their facilities are. Many of these objects that people see uh, of various shapes are man-made. Now, that's a bigger secret than the ET story. Why? Because if it were to get out, now we've had those sort of technologies since 1954, 68 years, and we didn't need to have rockets blowing up and killing space shuttle astronauts, uh, and the Apollo accidents that killed Apollo astronauts and jet fuel that when a plane crashes goes into a ball of fire and the damage to the environment and half the world in poverty since the 50s. This would be a thousand times more scandalous than Watergate. So they want the UFO subculture and the media that's begun to jump on this bandwagon to say, oh, this is a, uh, you know, we don't know what this is. Well, we do know what it is. You know, this is one of the big problems. There's this big gulf between what's known in covert programs and what, say, the, the people on the Senate Intelligence Committee or Armed Services Committee or, or these other oversight committees in the Congress, or for that matter, the president and the National Security Council. Everyone thinks that those folks have an all-access pass. They do not. And this was a very hard lesson I learned in 1993 when I was asked to fly up here from my hospital in North Carolina, where I was working as an emergency doctor and briefed the sitting director of the CIA and a bunch of other officials eventually, is that they did not have access to those projects, which I found to be, frankly, not credible. I did not believe it. I thought this is the biggest bunch of horse shit, excuse my language. Um, there's no way that you're the director of the CIA or the president and you're being blocked access to these projects that that my uncle and other people had, had knowledge of and uh, that I had collected a huge portfolio of evidence. But it is the case. And so I think the public, when they talk about the government keeping the secret, they're making a very big fundamental mistake in that primary statement because they're assuming that the government of we, the people, knows anything about most of this. Now, there are a few of them that do, and they are corrupt politicians on the payroll of this cabal of sociopaths and Nazis, but, um, but basically most of them have no idea. And when I meet with them, they're genuinely astonished that this could be true and they don't know about it because it might be a key member of the Senate Intelligence Committee or a key member of some other oversight committee. Or like I said, you know, uh, people in the Pentagon that I have briefed, like the head of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency that I briefed him and, and this is a guy, by the way, General Hughes, you know, if you know military intelligence, that's the top of the pecking order. The, 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 the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency is the top of all military intelligence in, in the United States. 
And he had been totally blocked and ridiculed for even asking about the subject, but he knew nothing about right. it. You just mentioned, um, yeah, uh, Patrick Hughes, and we have a question about him. So I thought it would be a good time to jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind mm -hmm. of a lengthy one. I'll read it out to you. Uh, from Joe Mojia, in 1998, uh, you and your former CSATI uh, military advisor, Commander Will Miller, uh, you briefed the sitting head of the DIA, uh, Patrick Hughes, the, the gentleman you just mentioned, mm -hmm. who had asked for the briefing to be expedited. Uh, you said mm -hmm. that uh, Patrick Hughes's dad uh, committed suicide because nobody in the government would take this seriously. Uh, is it possible that his dad learned something unsettling about the phenomena that led to his suicide? Can you expound on the Hughes family and their relationship with the phenomena? And I wanted to ask if Hughes was present for your briefing of Admiral Wilson in April of 1997 with Miller in attendance. No, those were separate. They were set up separately. And Admiral Wilson, um, with, in both all these cases, and I'm still doing this, what, I, what we do is we provide like a presidential briefing document that I've handed off to each president since uh, Clinton, uh, those are provided um, to them in advance. So there are documents and information and assessments and cases. And based on that, in, in the case of Admiral Wilson, this is not well understood. And you know the Eric Davis memo that came out where everyone it was all this big kerfuffle. I don't know why there was a big kerfuffle. I disclosed this meeting, what happened at it 20 years prior. But somehow everyone must have thought that somehow what I was saying could not possibly be true until this, this Dr. Davis released this transcript of his interview with Admiral Wilson years later. But uh, Admiral Wilson was wanting to be read in on this and he made inquiries. Now, he did, in fact, hit a couple of key points based on some documentation we had given him. And but the response he got back was. Uh, you know, basically the way he told it was that the uh, one office that he got hold of and contractor, because most of the really important work is WFO work for other contractors, like a Lockheed or some corporation. I mean, U.S. government doesn't make anything, you know, or they contract. So he uh, was told, you know, he said, look, I'm Admiral Wilson. I'm head of Intel. I'm J2, head of intelligence. He, they said, yes, sir. We know who you are. But he go and they go, but oh, you don't have a need to know. He says, how can I not have a need to know if I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff? They said, sir, we will not discuss this with you. And they cut the line. So he continued to dig into it. But eventually he got threatened uh, with demotion and other threats. And by demotion, I mean, they were going to take a star off his lapel and all this. So he was like, but when we had the meeting, I brought, um, there was an astronaut back in the day, Edgar Mitchell, who was an Apollo astronaut, that I was mentoring and sharing this information with. So I brought him to the meeting along with some other folks. And the Admiral was shaken, but, you know, it was supposed to be a 45 minute stand up briefing where I stand up and go through, you know, all this and the assessment, and the risk assessment, the matrix of, of, of risk of, of this being kept secret and being mismanaged this way, all that kind of thing. And what it ended up going on for like three hours, two or three hours. It only ended because Ed, Ed, Ed had to go up to a New York uh, City interview, TV interview. But um, the Admiral, you know, it was kind of poignant and sad at the end of it. I said, look, we really need your help to get this under control. This is an existential threat to the world and to the United States national security the way this is being managed. He says, yes, it is. He says, but the best thing I have, <laughs> it sounds kind of comical, is a B-2 stealth bomber that I know about. And I now know there's a group that have craft, man-made, that can do circles around my B-2 stealth. And he says, it's point, set, match. I mean, I'm outgunned. And he says, besides which, I couldn't start an investigation on this without the authorization of the SecDef, Secretary of Defense, and the President. I, he, I said, boy, that won't be forthcoming because both of them have been waved off and they are not going to push on this for fear of, well, as Bill Clinton's friend told me, fear of being ended up like Jack Kennedy, literally. So, so he says, well, then I'm very happy to have this information, but there's nothing I can do. Now that to, you can replay that little back and forth that I summarized in two or three minutes, many, many times here in Washington and London in Canada, Australia, other places. I've been to most of the Five Eyes countries, except New Zealand, discussing this with officials. But the, the problem is, you know, if they don't have authorization from their prime minister or, or president, 
to do the extraordinary things you'd have to do to get this under control, they're, they're kind of stuck. Now, the good news is the Congress has passed a law mandate that this be investigated, and that's now enshrined in the law. So there's a window open that we're moving through. Now, in the case of General Hughes, General Hughes was, um, I, don't, I didn't know his family. Look, I mean, my people set this up. I get ushered in. You're at the Pentagon. Um, but it, it was very poignant because what he did, the very first thing he did, he had, you know, we're in the conference room for the, for the general, uh, it, it, for the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, office. And he goes over to a bookshelf and grabs this little cheesy E.T. alien looking doll like you get at a store. Uh, you know, at Walgreens or something. And uh, he, he, looked, he, he says, this is all I've gotten for my inquiries through the chain of command. And I told him, I said, well, I have met with uh, people in, associated with the DIA who know about this because they're one of my disclosure project witnesses. He says, well, why won't they tell me? I said, because they don't want you to know. I said, your rank has nothing to do with it. I said, you're in the same camp as some of the presidents and senators I've met with and, and others. See, th and this is the upside down world of a beyond black. I mean, there are people I know who manage unacknowledged projects and black projects, but this is in its own category. And so, you know, this guy was really not happy about it. And the reason this issue came up uh, about his dad is that, and I don't know the circumstances of it. But he just his first question to me, which was a little disturbing and unnerving, was, Dr. Greer, we don't under, we don't know why you haven't committed suicide yet. Knowing what you. OK, so that, that is how that whole thing came up. And I didn't dwell on it. I just said, well, I have a different spiritual view and I sort of have a way of stress management. Wait, what did he mean by that? What did he mean by that? He meant that the gravity of knowing this and doing this, most people, when they see what you're up against, many people have committed suicide. It's, you know, I call it disclosure PTSD. It's, it's a special kind of uh, stressor, you know. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys, anyone listening, can imagine being a 30-some-year-old doctor flown, being flown up to brief the sitting director of the CIA, and he's shaken to his core because he and the president can't find out information um, on an issue that is of critical national security importance, that's when you realize the entire system is upside down, but also has been corrupted. You know, I, the best way to characterize the organization keeping all this secret, including the technologies that we need to bring out very quickly, the, at least the energy ones, if not the ones that fly, the ones that fly need to come out later because they could be missile delivery systems. But the ones that can sit in your house, like your heat pump and run your house with no uh, and no power bill and no pollution, or could it be in a, a, a test the car, get rid of the 900 pounds of lithium ion batteries that catch fire and are very polluting when you mine them and create them. Um, and you would have an electromagnetic motor, 300 horsepower motor like Floyd Sweet had. And he, he had a little cigarette pack size quantum uh, flux uh, device that would run that 300 horsepower engine. But of course, when he started to move that out, he got killed. He was assassinated. Um, and he's going to be, we're going to feature that. One of the people who worked with him, we've interviewed, he's still living and uh, he's uh, up there in some years and you're going to, you're going to hear about this, but, but that sort of thing is very stressful. And I think the, the people who I've met with in Washington, who got pretty close to this, they usually back off the edge of the cliff when they realize. Are, are we gonna... talking Senator Gillibrand and people like Marco Rubio, the people that are really pushing this, uh, like Matt Gallagher? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But there, yes, and there are, there's a, a, a growing number. The problem is um, they're, not, they're not allowed to know or read, be read in through channels uh, what's actually going on. I mean, they're still asking questions like, you know, geez, are these from China or are these, what are they? You know, um, so. Let me interject if you don't mind. Is that all right? Yeah. No, no, go okay. ahead. Yeah. So I know what people are thinking because uh, people are constantly thinking, so what's, where's the evidence for so-and-so? Because there's many, many claims here. Mm -hmm. And obviously you can't give evidence for each one because it would just be a, mm -hmm. a three-day event. I wouldn't mind a three-day event. That's actually pretty cool. I have a three-day podcast, but mm -hmm. either way. So <laughs> where is the evidence for, hmm, I don't have a specific claim in mind. 
So when certain ones come up, I may interject and be like, okay, what evidence is there for this that's accessible to other people? Because of course we can say so and so told me, and and I'm sure you wouldn't accept that as evidence. And and there is such a thing as disinformation. Well, it's hidden in it's in plain sight. Of course, nobody reads. I mean, the disclosure book is five hundred and some pages of, of whistleblower top secret transcripts and, and government documents. But, and it's there, anyone who wants to get it can get it. Just go get it. Would, would people be able to find your, you, you mentioned that you do have a kind of a presidential brief impact. Are people able to view that, for example? Not everything in there. It's something that I would want to put out because it has names and people. Here's, here's something that you have to understand. Out of the 1,100 or so guys who come to me and some women who worked in these areas, only less than 10% of them have been willing to be exposed publicly. In other words, um, there's a man I'm working with right now who is at the Nellis Range on a retrieval team to retrieve both man-made UFOs that became disabled and uh, extraterrestrial ones. And But he has had so many threats, he does not want to be known in the public. But I will give his information to these key black project investigators here in Washington. But and he he's happy with that. So you could release the document, but redact those names. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the last like in April, I did a three day <laughs> uh, workshop and we had a whole hour, hour and a half where I presented his evidence in his case. But and the details, so there was nothing withheld except the man's name. Um, now, that's because. One of the things, if you want people to come to you with very sensitive information that for which they've been threatened with being killed, um, if, if, if they were to be known publicly talking about it, then you better keep their, uh, their identities confidential, which I do. Yeah. I mean, and any doctor is trained to do that. People come to doctors and tell, um, I have a friend who's a medical doctor up in Dayton, Ohio at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and, and he's had many people who work there on the ET materiel and, and other technologies, spinoff technologies. But, you know, he would never speak of those people's names publicly because it was done within the, the sanctity of the doctor patient relationship. Um, and he would not violate that, although he will give me that information only because I'm a fellow physician and he knows I'm going to convey it to people who can actually do something about it. Um, and, you know, who are now authorized by law, mandated by law, by the way, to do this. Now, you know, you have to make a distinction between what I'm talking about right now and the dog and pony show at the Pentagon office and the congressional office and what you see in Politico and the New York Times. That's none of that's relevant to what I'm discussing. This is happening with with people who actually have the ability to do something. Uh, most of these things, it's like Project Blue Book was sort of a PR front store operation to satisfy members of Congress and, and the public, the real actions were going on elsewhere. And this is, th this is unfortunate. I mean, I, my own feeling is that all of it all would be very transparent and happening very quickly, but you know, the United States government doesn't operate that way, nor does any other government. Um, and, but I do think that, you know, there's great progress right now being made. I mean, more in the 32 years I've been doing this, it's the biggest breakthroughs that I have seen in 32 years. And so there's a lot of potential. Let's just say there's a lot of potential. Have you ever thought about your car personality? So what's your vibe? Classic, fully gas powered? Or are you more like the many worlds interpretation where you want the best of both worlds? That is driving battery powered while keeping gas for reserve, just in case. Or are you more inclined to choose a convenient hybrid ride? Whichever your vibe, there's a Tucson Hyundai to match and a powertrain to get you there. Hyundai's 2023 Tucson lineup pairs the tech you want with sleek and stylish designs. They paid attention to all the details, the seat, the dash, the available panoramic roof, you name it, Hyundai thought of it. All while making sure that each trim has enough room for grocery runs, festival nights, and tailgates. Okay, Hyundai. When it comes to your journey, Hyundai is there for every mile. Visit HyundaiUSA.com to learn more about the 2023 Hyundai Tucson. The 2023 Tucson Hybrid is only sold in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maine, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Vermont. What I like, especially about the first part of this, when you came on about the open sourceness. Now, mm -hmm. yes. I am I'm not an academic, but I'm trained as an mm -hmm. academic. So I like open source. And then the question about the briefing. So why won't you release it? Well, there's names. Okay, that's cool. And then 
you have released it to some of the people who are at some live event. Now, is there a reason that it's exclusive to people at a live event? Because I'm sure then... Oh, no, it's, it's up on our YouTube channel. Now, remember, our YouTube channel has like 500 videos, some of which are two to four hours long. And it's Dr. Stephen Greer. It's whatever it is. Like slash, in PDF form. I mean, like PowerPoint presentation or however it is that you deliver. Oh, yes. Well, that's those are going to be create. That's what we're creating. So this huge archive that we are collecting that uh, we're putting together for the U.S. government, White House, National Security Council, Congress. That we're going to have a version of it when we get it done, hopefully in the next uh, 10 months, that would be accessible by the public. But, you know, again, you have to understand we're not a rich podcast like you. We're of all volunteers and uh, we don't have an office or staff. Now, I am hiring away from an aerospace company. I'm not a rich podcast, just so you know. Oh, I thought the same. <laughs> oh, well, you know, when I was on Joe Rogan, you know, those kind of people. I was never offered two billion. Then, Oh, you weren't given a hundred million dollars by Spotify. And you know, no. <laughs> if you would take my interview out of the lineup, you know, that's what Joe yeah. Rogan did. He took the, he took my interview out of the lineup so he could get the hundred million dollars from my Spotify. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. How do you think deals like that are made? There's a quid pro quo. Let's take out anything that's really inflammatory. Anyway, um, <laughs> you see how cynical I am about the media, uh, big media. So at any rate, <laughs> well, like, hey, firstly, like I commend you. I'm, I'm happy that you're on, and I appreciate that you're, you're willing to come in here and answer some questions. That again, like it's, it sounds answering, but just a fatuous person. So when I say what's evidence for so and so, I mean no disrespect. It's just my no. Academic we have mind. we have all the evidence you want, but I, again, we put these together in so many formats, whether it's video, books, you know, but most people, you know, they can only stand reading the headlines. So if people want to drill down in it, go drill down on them. I have five books out. Um, there are, you know, like I said, a, a thousand hours or more of, of really densely packed information and presentations with those PowerPoints on the YouTube channel. Great. great. I appreciate uh, so, that you're not so, offended by it. I, I appreciate no, that. No, not at all. It, I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it's, 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 there'll it's, be more it's, questions it's, like that coming. The, yeah. There'll be anyone <laughs> like that uh, should, uh, you know, I mean, but what I say is say, you know, go do it. You know, I can't spoon feed it to you if you're not willing to read. Of course, nobody, it's politically incorrect to read or do math, as you know. Um, okay, so about the, the documentary that's coming up, The Lost Century and How to Regain It, the you said there's a plan for there to be a push of something open source with regard to energy. How's that coming? Does that come along with the website? Like, how does that work? Does that come a week before, a week no, after? No, let, let me be clear. We don't have any tech. We don't have an inventor or technology group that's willing to do that because they're like, you know, the movie uh, Lord of the Rings, my precious, my precious Gollum with his ring. Ironically, some of them are toroidal rings. Uh, Those folks do not want to lose control of it and ownership of it by open sourcing it. But they don't understand if they would open source it and connect to a big group a strategic group like we've created that could get the word out to a billion people. Uh, I mean, you know, my first, here's how, how sort of out of the box, I think about stuff like this. Everybody wants to go through a normal venture capital rounds of funding, which is ridiculous because if you had a company that had a market cap of what Tesla motors does with a trillion dollars, it's not enough. It's too little and it's too late. The only way we're going to fix this existential crisis on the planet is that these technologies are released open source. And there are a thousand companies that are developing it. Now, the person who developed it originally, it's like if you invented the first Xerox machine, there's going to be a huge inflow of support. But the other thing, the reason that thinking is so not correct is that there's 1.5 billion cars on the road that have to be retrofitted and converted. There are two and a half billion homes. Well, what General Electric, General Motors, Amazon, and Apple all together could not do that in 20 years, and it has to be done in 20 years. So this is like a, I call it like a global Marshall Plan, like the plan that we had to, to rescue Europe after World War II, where we put together you know, the funding and the strategy to resurrect from the ashes Western Europe. Well, this is a global plan that has to happen. It has to happen within 20, 25 years. And to do it, you need a huge amount of involvement. It can't be something where you're just sitting on it secretively. Ironically, 
the secretiveness about this is what gets people killed, number one, because they're targeting themselves. So like, let's say you, uh, Kurt, have one of these devices and you have a team of 12 investors and physicists and electromagnetic engineers. It'd be so easy to rub you out and you'd vanish and who the hell would ever know about it? This is what happened to the team that got the Stan Meyer archive, you know, because he, Stan Meyer, not only had a car that was running on water, it was actually running on zero point. We can get to that in a moment if you want to hear the physics of it. Um, and the, uh, the, he also had a device that had a national security order on it that we knew about. I have photographs of it. And it was like a toroid. And it was putting out enormous amounts of energy, way more than you had to supply to it, because it was also accessing this um, very high voltage electromagnetic charge system that taps into and creates sort of a space time cavitation from the zero point. And this is what they're doing. So that ended up being. Can you talk more about the physics, too? You said you could talk about the physics. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's if you're, if you're talking to a general audience, who's gonna, no one's going to care about pointing vectors and the, what Maxwell equations were altered and all that stuff. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is that they, we were trying to get it, but they had a big funder that outbid us for the Stan Meyer warehouse, including this toroid. And that was the real action, by the way, not the car. <laughs> well. A couple of years later, and you know, I had a huge amount of funding. It was up in Michigan. I finally get a call from Lord somebody, I won't say his name, uh, in the British Isles, who had been the funder. And he was in a panic. He says, look, they're on the run for their lives. They've got all this stuff operational. Now, remember, the day that it slipped into that world where they were going to try to monetize it secretively, I said, these are all dead men walking. I said that, you know, the, the way they're doing this is guaranteed to fail. It is guaranteed to fail. But now finally, this Lord so-and-so calls me up. I don't, he got my number somehow and he's in a panic and I'm here in Washington. I said, well, let me write a strategic overview uh, of what needs to happen within 24 to 48 hours. Because they were saying, oh, we're going to go to an eco-friendly country. I said, you'd have to go to an eco-friendly star system. There's nowhere on this planet where this these the henchmen who want to keep this secret won't get you find you it's just not going to happen um they don't rep, they don't recognize any geopolitical country boundaries for their operations tactically so i said look you do this so it was exactly what we're talking about you open source it immediately you then hand off all that information to us and i will get you know, 20 of the top celebrities working on this to, to announce it to all their fans and get all the fan girls and fan boys of people like from Justice Bieber to whoever, you know, Godsmack to Justice Bieber. Yeah, they're all really into it. So um, so what what I tell people is that why? Because I said, because you're going to get blocked at the media level, which is controlled by corporate they're shills for big corporate interests. You're going to get blocked by uh, the tech companies. But what they cannot block are these big influencers who have 100, 200 million followers on Instagram or wherever. And those people have one of these devices running their house. How are you going to stop if one of these A-list celebrities or 20 or 30 of them have their cars and their house running? You know, it, it, you know people say, what's well, the PR stunt? I said, no, it's not. It's a way to get around the embargo of this information through the corrupt media. So I said, but look, this is what this is what you got to do. You got to do it very quickly. Now, the next thing I know, they they had decided they were going to still keep it secret. They wanted to be, you know, like Gollum and Gollum with the Lord of the Rings and hold on to their precious. My, they were, to my knowledge, all but one of them were killed. They all vanished. Okay, so let's talk about the physics of the precious. And I was involved in that very, very specifically. It's very sad. So the physics aspect, you mentioned that people may not, people, just so you know, come to this podcast in particular for the technicalities of physics. That's what we're, our main bread oh, and butter do. is physics. Mm -hmm. yes, okay. Yes. So okay. you're welcome, more than welcome to speak as advanced as you like. Well, one, one thing to look at is the, is the research that, that's been done um, 
by people like Ken Shoulders, who, who since have passed away, who had his charge cluster arrays. And basically what those were, were little tiny ball lightning. And it, it's now been discovered that these little electrostatic ball lightning type packets, when they discharge, they're actually perturbing or stimulating this, this quantum flux zero point field of energy. And it causes a, a cavitation in space time that causes an enormous uh, force, a forward moving force that can be put against a pit center, turn a rotor for a generator or what have you. Most scientists over the last hundred years didn't know how that was happening. It got imaged uh, not too long ago, very, very well by a scientist, a, a physicist in Tokyo, I believe it's the University of Tokyo, I forget the gentleman's name, where they were able to image that this is what was going on. Now, that's true of whether it was Stan Meyer with his electrostatic system to create hydrogen and oxygen gas. The hydrogen and oxygen gas from dissociating, you have to you know, beat the, the Faraday constant, you know, the amount of elect electrical injury that has to go into from an electrolyzer to separate the bond of hydrogen and oxygen, which is what H2O water is. In this case, the, even the amount of hydrogen and oxygen gas wouldn't explain how far that car would run. Because if you calculate the energy of what's in that hydrogen and oxygen gas, so what it was really doing, and this is because it was doing it on demand, it was actually accessing this excess energy, let's call it, from this baseline quantum flux field or, or zero point energy field through these high voltage uh, circuits. Now, I don't think Stan Meyer understood the physics of it because that's just now getting increasingly elaborated. A very good source for this is Maury King's book that talks about water, uh, the, the, the source of new energy and the zero point. Um, it's a bit dense because it's, he's an engineer. and it's a, But if you're a physicist, I'd recommend you take a look at that book, um, Maury King. We just interviewed him about this. So there are many ways to do it. It's basically people have done it with different media. You can do it through an electromagnetic crystalline substance. You can do it through water. You can do it this through the circuitry of um, electrically charged steel, like the Holcomb device down in Florida. And you can also do it through solid state uh, oscillator resonance, where you're, you're having the same effect uh, in, in these. And the key thing is here, VHV, very high voltage systems at certain frequencies. And these sort of little what you look at it, when you look at it microscopically, these tiny ball lightning type phenomenon that create this sort of cavitation in space time. How so, high of a voltage are we talking about? Millions. millions uh, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, volts. Yeah. But a very low, low uh, current. So the power is very low. So you might put 100 watts into a system and get, you know, a kilowatt out or five kilowatts out. Ultimately, you know, I just was at a place out in the desert of uh, Arizona where we witnessed, and this is going to be, we're going to show this on our, our pod, not podcast, our webinar on October 25th, this device that had, I think it was four magnesium alloy plates. And this particular device was more like an original Tesla, sort of a miniaturized version of Wardenclyffe, where this guy, for after 40 years of trying to do this, something that's a little bit bigger than a shoebox. And it, the startup power is a three-volt battery, which you could take out. And it's actually pulling the magnetic flux and the what's called the negative energy that's around us. Uh, and it's it was when we were there a few weeks ago, it was had been running for over two years. This negative energy around us? Well, he calls it negative energy. I think it's what I think a lot of these terms are fungible because they're still being defined. Uh, I think what he calls negative energy is actually an aspect of the, the zero point, the quantum flux field. Um, so, with, you know, without getting too much further into those weeds, the, the, what the strange thing about his device, it has to be tuned to the magnetic field and of, of the Earth exactly where it is, because it's actually feeding off the flow of energy from the sun to the earth and the magnetosphere is very interesting. Very, it's very Tesla like, but instead of it being this gigantic thing, it's like this big. I mean, you know, so we're there and I, we test it. There are no wires going into it. It's putting out 
um, uh, it was putting out, we, we've got it around five kilowatts and no energy input. Now, uh, interestingly, even when it was started, it was a little three volt battery, tiny little battery. So this is quite ingenious. You could certainly, uh, it's probably not as robust. It can't be like put in a vehicle and move because it's tuned to this frequency of, of on the earth. You know, there, anywhere you go on earth, there's a magnetic field frequency. So his system is dependent on that being tuned. Others are not, others are not. So uh, there are many ways to skin this cat, but this was a very fascinating, but again, he had made every conceivable strategic mistake to guarantee it will never benefit humanity. And so in a way, it was a case in uh, looking at, of course, this guy is, you know, quite, quite up there in years now. Um, he's also, you know, a scientist, but he, he really thinks he's going to somehow beat the power grid companies by creating a megawatt plant and selling it to the, to selling it to the utilities. I said, no, those companies are vertically and horizontally integrated into people who do not want this solution. And the laws around and regulations around tapping into the grid are so regulated by state, federal, and local bureaucracies that they'll kill this and strangle it in its cradle in two seconds. So what I find is that you find these ingenious devices attached to completely wacky strategies because they're, they're not figuring in their strategy of how to get it out what their adversary is capable of. And, and they're, here's your big mistake. You cannot underestimate your adversary. Uh, and your adversary is, you know, got more power and wealth than the entire U.S. government and very exotic technologies to get in your way. I mean, when I say exotic, the studying of this sort of science and technology, what the CIA guys call WSFM, this whole area of science is weird science and frickin' magic. What's it called again? Wait. Repeat it once more. <laughs> WSFM. If you ever hear that term in the corridors of some contractor. It's a, a weird science and freaking magic. Um, at, at North of Grumman, they just call it PFM, pure fucking magic. Excuse my language. But, uh, but, but they call it magic because you have all this phenomenon that happens. It's not magic. It's just like, it's, it's new science. Um, but let me interject. If you don't mind, I'd like to get into the weeds. I know that you want to get out of the weeds. Let's just delve mm -hmm. into it for a tiny bit. So mm -hmm. how does one produce the voltage that's required? the millions or tens of millions of volts, like practically? Well, well, some of them don't need that, but some of them do. Like this gentleman, he just had a startup. Once he tapped into the frequency and the magnetic field right there, he would have this small three volt battery to start the initial resonance in these plates. There's a group up in Canada that has a very similar system. So not all of them have to have that, but your, some of your classical uh, systems, for example, T. Townsend Brown and his ability to create this lifter or anti-gravity effect or gravity control effect. Uh, well, what's really meant by they tap into the frequency? Like what, you're talking to a, a classically trained person. I have issues with the zero point. So for instance, you need a difference. It doesn't matter if there's energy around you. And then if there is, then why doesn't it create a black hole? Because then you would need quantum field theory mm -hmm. and general relativity. So mm -hmm. there are many questions that arise if, if you don't mind just like what is it? What is meant by what is what is this frequency, and what's meant by tapping into the frequency? It's what what I'm trying to say in lay terms. But I mean, I don't know how far to. If you have, let's say, you have a two million volt uh, system, but very low current, you know. So you know, maybe it's only you know static electricity. By the way, is millions of volts. Like when it's cold and you you zap, that's millions of volts, but incredibly low power because there's not much current. If you have a sustained uh, voltage like that at certain frequencies, hertz, cycles per second, it will create, uh, as some have described it, a, a vector, a, a perturbation of the ambient energy field and cause, as, as Maury King describes it, sort of this cavitating effect uh, from the zero point where it actually pulls out some little bit of it. Now, remember, it's been estimated that you know, at the level of zero point energy, uh, the, uh, the volume of uh, inside a coffee mug, that much space, amount of space has enough potential power to boil off all the waters of the planet. Minor quiddity here. Static electricity is on the order of 15,000 volts and not a million or tens of millions. 
I believe Dr. Greer simply misspoke, as we all do, and I'm correcting here in part so that you don't go trying to build a device wondering why the heck is it not working or ruining your family dinners with physics tidbits like I do. So it's, it's you know, this is why Tesla kind of referred to it, although he didn't understand that's what it was, this sort of infinite energy field. But to actually access it, you have to do these um, various physics and electromagnetic engineering uh, techniques. And it's different for different substances. If it's just electric steel, which is what uh, Dr. Holcomb is doing with his Holcomb energy system, that's different from what this gentleman in the desert was doing with the magnetic field of the earth, which was different from what Stan Meyer was doing with water. But the principles, it, you know, the un this is why you know, one of the things I've been advocating is some venture capitalist who actually, you know, you know, there's <laughs> billions of dollars being spent on pseudo solutions that someone puts together. And this is also going to be one of the appeals we're going to make an open source physics research and development lab funded to you know, 50 to 100 million dollars to start with so that you can put the best people in place, study these devices that have come and gone and optimize it into a solid state system that's stable, that could begin to be moved out to the public. Um, I think that if you had such a facility and support and it was done open source, you'd probably would have uh, at least your first system developed within one to two years. Uh, and, and at that point, it would have to be massively disclosed. Is there any way of working with the Galileo project on something like this? I don't think that they're focusing on this. We're looking for things way out there. And, and there, there are folks associated with that project that are uh, embedded counterintelligence people. Would you be willing to, to have Galileo's equipment present during a CE5 expedition? Uh, I, don't, I haven't drilled down on what their equipment is. I think they're still very linear. And uh, they, it, they're looking at things like the electromagnetic space above the the sensors. They're watching for things in the sky. They have various cameras that will triangulate uh, anything that it sees. Um, and they're really not, um, you, you know, differentiating between whether they see a bird or something anomalous. They want to gather all the data they can. Avi's mm -hmm. a friend, so I can set mm -hmm. something up. Like I'm, I'm just curious what the answer would be. Well, it's it's certainly possible. I think some of that equipment could be very useful during a CE five event. Remember, most of what happens is transdimensional. Um, it's coming back and forth from one dimension to another, tra transits dimensions. Um, anything that's truly interstellar is not going through a straight line of an electromagnetic field. Um, but that may, part of it is that the whole understanding of the phenomenon is, is flawed because they're trying to interpret some uh, technology that's 10 to the 6th to 10 to the ninth years further along than ours are um, using nominally more sophisticated understanding of physics than uh, what existed uh, during the time of Einstein and relativity and quantum physics. And that's not going to cut it um, because now we get into what the ultimate singularity is, which is the consciousness field and the plasticity of space and time and how all this sort of phenomenon happens. But so the question is, you have to design your equipment, understanding a broader spectrum. Now, one of the good things about modern cameras with light cells, the CCDs or whatever they are, those actually perceive and pick up data much better than the human eye by far. And so that's one of the things we've been developing is, you know, how do you use those in a setting where an event might be happening and there's some prodromal, some indication there's something around you and you can then image it with these sort of cameras at what setting, uh, what's optimal, what's the exposure, all that. So, you know, if they have information on that, well, I mean, we'd certainly be happy to share with them what our experience has been, although in full disclosure, I don't operate cameras at all. I'm, you know, I run the other way and give me a defibrillator, you know, but, um, but that, that's, that's something that yeah could be very useful, but I think you, you have to begin to look at it. Everyone's trying to force a, a round peg in a, in a square hole when it comes to the science and physics of this. They're not looking broadly enough. Why would civilizations that are hundreds of thousands to millions of years more developed than we are be using the physics that you, no offense, or Avi would understand? They're not. So you have to be open up to the possibility of, of how these sorts of 
phenomenon happen? And then what are the conditions that optimize them? Because as you get increasingly into uh, the, the ultimate non-locality and entanglement is the consciousness field. And that is, by the way, here's a hint, that, that is the singularity. But it actually is quantifiable. For example, the communication systems between these interstellar civilizations are actuated. They have devices, but they're interfacing at the level of the quanta of thought and consciousness. I'm not talking Elon Musk with a chip in your brain sort of thing, turning on your computer, but very advanced, um, what we call technology-assisted consciousness and the other way around, consciousness-assisted technologies. And, and, those, and so, so all of that, you know, if you're sitting out there sterilely trying, I'm being doctor or whatever, um, and you're, you're, you're locked into a virtually one notch better than Newtonian physics, you're not going to get very far um, because you're not dealing with, you know, humans from 2022. Now, the people, who, the people in classified projects would understand this uh, because they've been studying it for a very long time down to the level of the, the you know, science and the technologies. Um, and, but knowing that information is useful to a research team like the obvious because if, if they know that information, they're going to be able to get some very good clues on how to, set up their experiments and set up their reconnaissance systems. Firstly, if it's a nominal increase in physics from, let's say, Newton or Einstein, how is it achieved by someone like Tesla, Nikola Tesla? And then, and then <laughs> secondly, when it comes to the volts, is it the static elect the same volts that's involved in static electricity, or is it of the order of millions? It, de it, it really depends on what you're using, what the substrate is. You know, you're doing this through water, you're doing this through uh, a crystalline material, or you're doing it through a nanocrystalline material. It varies. This is why it has to be, it's sort of like a tuning of the voltage combined with the, the frequency. And that's, that's where you get some very major breakthroughs. And those principles, if they're understood, and you look at these uh, technologies that have come and gone for 100 years, there's a, a definite pattern. Uh, now, I'm not saying that all those guys understood what was going on. I don't know if any do, anyone does yet, um, frankly, uh, because but then I point out, you know, as a medical doctor, which we tend to be very much more practical, uh, we use uh, the Jackson Foxglove for heart failure because it increased the contractile strength of the muscle for 100 years before we were able to figure out what the mechanism of action on the you know, very fine chemical and cellular, molecular, cellular level was. Aspirin, well, from the bark of a tree, right? Uh, aspirin had certain known observed effects, but it was fairly recently, actually, that it was understood how aspirin works. So you have to understand that in a complex tr trans-dimensional universe, you're going to see effects, and let's just say, results of certain empirical configurations of electromagnetics and frequencies and voltages and what have you. I mean, it may be 50 or 100 years later that you fully understand how it's happening. Um, but I think this is, this, is why I, this is why I try to avoid people who get into these physics arguments of how many angels are dancing on the, 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 the head of a pen because most people don't realize that there's a great many things we use in our society that we actually don't know how they work. We just know like, they do work. All right. Like anesthetics is similar, right? Yeah. There's all like, kinds. Yes. All kinds of, uh, and, and I think doctors are more comfortable with that than physicists because it's a, a much more dynamic system uh, because you have a human being who's conscious and there are all kinds of phenomena associated with the mind and the body and the neurons in the heart and the brain and all of this. And so um, I, I think that it, the approach to it has to be much broader uh, than what people think would be. Now, from just an electromagnetic engineering point of view, I think the reason so many of these have been stumbled upon by people over the last 100 plus years uh, is, is that it's once you start playing around, let's say, and experimenting, it's empirical with certain types of uh, materials and certain types of electronic frequencies. You get into some phenomenon, I mean, up to and including 
bringing tapping into other dimensions that could bring critters from another dimension into this dimension. I mean, they did this at the cube at the Lockheed at Skunk Works. Uh, and I, I know also at a couple other labs that have, yeah, but this gets into stranger things. I'm sure some people would be thinking like, well, okay, that's a huge claim. A huge, I'm not of the sort that says huge claims require huge evidence because evidence is evidence. It's not like there's huge evidence and, and a diminutive evidence. Mm -hmm. So, but either way, it's like evidence is evidence. And I'm, I'm curious, what, so do you mind expounding on this claim of if you tap into so-and-so physics, I'm, I'm unsure what that precisely means, but if you tap into so-and-so, physics under certain configurations, a dimension is opened up and, and different mm -hmm. entities can come in or go out. Yep. Like, please expand well, on that. And then, and then with the key of, of technicality, if you can, because like, that's what this podcast is known for equations. If you can, if there are, I know that's a strange thing to ask. I don't think physicists are anywhere near as close-minded as you suggest. Now there's many ideas, multiverse, string theory. Those are far mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Newtonian mechanics. And you mentioned Maxwell and pointing vectors. If just manipulating those are what's required or some other factor needs to be added that was taken out by heavy side, it's mm -hmm. not as if that's not known to physicists or out of the realm of what they would accept playing with and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, going back to this assertion about the entities coming in and out. Well, again, you know, I, I, it, it, what, what they did experimentally is they would have a, a, a very similar to a toroid device and at a certain frequency and voltage. And there are, you could, you know, there are, the algorithm for this would be millions of them that could be combined. They would have weird stuff like Stranger Things or Montauk, boom, come into the lab. And this, I know three different labs where this has happened. They can also alter space time. There's a guy down in the, near the Redstone Arsenal that had one of these systems and it would actually snap time, you know, so the environment around where he was working altered uh, off the timeline back and forth uh, very very unusual uh, phenomenon and that guy a uh, brilliant physicist and engineer uh, he works through a contractor uh, for the CIA but uh, and I've been in his skiff and, and where he does his work so uh, now again I'm not I don't build these systems. I understand the principles of how they work, but that kind of phenomenon has been observed by people in these specialized labs for, gosh, I mean, decades. Which labs? Three labs, which of them? The Lockheed Skunk Works in the Cube, the skiff that's down there, the Redstone Arsenal, and the, uh, the old Montauk operations on Long Island. Is this related at all to what's happening at Skinwalker? Yes, because remember, Skinwalker was a, a Native American known area of unusual phenomenon and contact. There's a gentleman named uh, Bob Bigelow, Robert Bigelow, who I first met at the Rockefeller Ranch in 1993, who, uh, along with some of his sidekicks, uh, Colonel John Alexander and others, um, wanted to acquire that property and in, in the rancher didn't want to sell it. So they set up a lot of this uh, weird WSFM electromagnetic phenomenon that was scary as shit. And the guy uh, relented and eventually sold it. It has since been resold to another person. And of course, I guess it's been sensationalized in some TV show. But the uh, there's a lot of activity going on underground there. Well, we were out there about a year and a little over a year ago and observed uh, late night, uh, what very much sounds like under, under the facility, a drilling um, and a building of something deep underground. And my understanding, it's sort of like the, um, uh, the, Brad, uh, the Bradshaw Ranch in Sedona that got taken over by and, and turned into a black site. So I think that the Skinwalker Ranch has all kinds of a weird phenomenon that has to do with this kind of experimentation and that it has nothing to do with what was innately there prior to. Uh, so I think this is, again, often when there's something quite interesting happening like that, you have people from who are fronting for the intelligence community or being manipulated by them who then uh, acquired as an asset. 
Um, and so that, you know, sort of what's called capture, where it'll get, you know, they'll try to capture that and then use it to their own purposes. And whatever is going on after they get involved, it has a faint resemblance to what was there prior to the acquisition. So I, my understanding is that we went out there and did actually a close encounter of the fifth kind CE5 contact event uh, in June of 2021. Very That's interesting. Walker. Yeah. Well, no, on a mesa overlooking it. So we were near it. We weren't on the property. So we're talking in the Uinta Basin, yeah. Well, it, w- it was on a, some private land adjacent to and sort of above where the ranch would be if you went down. Okay. So yeah, so, in, in, in the Basin. But, but very close. And uh, so, so, I mean, you know, it, nothing all that extraordinary, except we did observe um, this sound of drilling. And of course, it, it reminded me of uh, back in the 80s, you know, all the new agers were going on about the Taos hum uh, and, you know, around Taos, New Mexico and, um, and out in that area of, of northern New Mexico. And of course, that was a Bechtel uh, nuclear powered tunneling machine making the connector between Los Alamos and the Dulce area which cannot be accessed from the ground or, or above, but only from uh, tunneling. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, that device was brought on in the 60s, 70s. But it's, uh, of course, it's classified It's nuclear power. So people would not like the idea of some nuclear powered thing running under their uh, land. But that's how you connect, say, from Edwards to Nellis or Los Alamos to Dulce. And so it sounds like, from what I understand, you know, that's happening at the Skinwalker Ranch, probably connecting out to another facility like uh, the Dugway Proving Grounds or someplace like that. In, in Utah, Dugway is a very key. I mean, certainly, I think that much more significant than so-called Area 51 is this newer underground dumb, as they're called, deep underground military base operations out near Dugway. You know, you, you spoke this- a little... Yeah. Go on. <laughs> okay, there's this claim about the Atacama mummy that it was faked or that junk science was done on it. And four... Mm, yeah, no question. Like it, into the re- when I was doing some research into this, there's four Stanford professors who are specialists in DNA and genomics mm. and pa- pediatric disorders and so on, graduate students, postdocs, and so on. Mm. So that helped analyze and collect the data. So what's your evidence for claiming that it's fake? Why do you say that? Well, the, the principal person who said he would do the testing on it at Stanford, uh, he got a three, three and a half million dollar Teal grant, uh, sort of a made up grant from the Department of Defense about the time I handed off the genetic sample. At that point, there were people who don't want to be named who offered to help him do it on what's called ancient DNA. Ancient doesn't mean thousands of years old, but in other words, it's, it's desiccated and it's from a deceased creature. Um, he refused that help. Uh, one of the men who evaluated that gentleman and a man who worked with Watson and Crick and has many, many patents and is one of the premier geneticists in the world, looked at their data, actually went into the database. And it was quite clear that it was uh, skewed and defrauded and altered. But because they were able to get these guys' names on that, uh, yeah, if you look at, we do, they're on our YouTube channel, there's an entire uh, expose about this uh, and uh, what the reports are. And I've left the guy's names off of it because they don't want to be attacked for having pointed out the fraud that would happen at UCSF and Stanford, which I'm not proud to say. I have a daughter who got her PhDs at UCSF, but uh, and I have a daughter, Stanford. So, I mean, I just think that it's a tragedy that this happens. Junk science happens all the time. And the whistleblowers who know about it often have their careers ruined. Um, but I think that that was a classic case of uh, junk science being pushed forward as results. And it wasn't. So if, you, if you're an expert in that area and you don't look at just at the text of the paper, but actually drill down. Now, we still don't know what this Atacama creature is. I have no idea what it is. I never said it was alien. I just said that it doesn't conform with any known organism. And in fact, Dr. Lockman, who is the um, you know kind of world's expert on genetic bone deformities, said definitively, and that's is in our reports on our website, that this was a, a a creature that was at least six years of old by looking at the bones and the epiphyseal closures, you know, where the bones, the growth plates, and and their development, it'd be the equivalent of a of a six year old human 
in terms of its bone development. Let me be clear. Just so is the claim that he lied for money? Is that the claim or or that he didn't know exactly what he was doing? What is the it, it, it claim? Needs, we don't know. It needs to be uh, investigated. We, you know, we have recommended that Stanford and UCSF and, and uh, Cold Spring Harbor, the, the, where they published the article originally, uh, launch an investigation um, because there's something that is very not right with this. And this is according to people who are way past my specialty as a doctor, who are real renowned experts in genetics and molecular biology, where they clearly can prove that this was deliberately done improperly. Would, so would they be willing? But these are the anonymous people you're referring to, or oh, I'm sure they would. They would succumb to a subpoena. They're not going to be on a salacious UFO show or something. Where would, would they men. write a peer review paper? Where mm -hmm. other people not involved, you know, with with I Mr. Nolan's them, lab could. I asked them to, but I think they're they're intimidated. They see this big machine of disinformation running them over, and uh, one of them has his own biotech company, and uh, the other one is is up there in years, and uh, he just doesn't want the grief. You know, he's I think he's in his eighties, but I mean, he had worked with Watson and Crick, and you know, a very renowned. Caltech molecular biologists and geneticists. And you know, I've had some serious people look at it. This has been one of my frustrations. We're going to have to have people who are willing to, you know, when you find this kind of corruption, most people don't want to take on the, the scandal and, and the controversy and the blowback that happens uh, because usually, you know, it's not a good thing to be a whistleblower, um, particularly when you're going up against a power structure of corrupt interests. So and exactly how it happened and why I have my own theory, <laughs> um, but I, th I just point out it's a very unusual coincidence that they got a three and a half million dollar kind of one off made up teal grant from the Pentagon uh, at the time of the handoff of the genetic material. As a logical point, it's not always the case that the money has a causal effect in some other area. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I'm sure that people have thrown accusations at you like, look, you've raised X amount or you want X amount or you're given mm -hmm. X amount. But you're like, that doesn't tarnish what I do. So even if that's the case. Well, but I, the, the, the timing is suspicious and forget about that. It's the results. If you're if you I, I challenge anyone to go into actual the database attached to that report and not come to the same conclusion these other scientists have come to. But nobody does that. They just read the paper and the conclusions. They're not going into the whole methodology. And the ones who have, every single one of them have concluded the same thing. So, you know, that's water under the bridge. I mean, it's just something I come to expect from people in academia. It would it would be great if we could see a peer review paper come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you, responding. you find some honest people who aren't subject to threats and bribes, and and I'll give them I will give them a retained sample of the DNA. Okay, great. Because we have we we didn't we didn't give all of it. Trust me. In the beginning, you mentioned you would like people who are afraid for their lives. They have some free energy enterprise or or invention to come to you and and hey there's a 200 trillion dollar industry of energy or more X amount that. yeah that would come down on them but you're saying look 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 i can protect you and you shouldn't be afraid no the, no the protection is the massive disclosure of it. see what people don't understand is that if you keep it secret and you're the only person that knows or there are 10 people who know about it you're very vulnerable I mean, it's just it, it should be common sense and you want to get it out of, you know, if you get that hot potato out of just your own uh, house, you want to have it out there also so that peer review people can say, all right, here's the plans for it. Let's reproduce it because the sine qua non of science is independent verification and reproducibility. That's the other problem that doesn't happen because people are conditioned by venture capital and their investors, keep it secret, keep it secret. But that really, when you're dealing with a fundamental new area of science, that doesn't work. It needs to be put out there to be checked and reproduced by other uh, people skilled in the art, as they would say, of, of electromagnetic engineering and physics. So I think that's, that's the recommendation. Uh, it's, a, it's, a it's, a, it's a strategic recommendation as opposed to saying I personally, but I could help with that. I know that we could help with that. Um, but the mistake that they all make is, is taking the advice of lawyers and businessmen and conventional 
venture capital people who, uh, of course, are doing what would conventionally be done. And I would say that if you're inventing a new iPhone or a new software program, okay, maybe that works. Um, when you're dealing with a technology that's going to upend the whole petrodollar and macroeconomic structure on the planet that is based on the type of energy system we use, you're dealing with a different set of strategic variables and you have to alter your plan accordingly. But that doesn't happen. They're all making the same predictable mistakes for 100 years. And that's it's a tragedy. And I think we're not going to change the outcome. I don't care who the person is. Uh, I know that there, there are folks like Dr. Randall Mills had black light power, something like $100 million. Um, it was all very secretive. It vanished. You know, I mean, you know, these things happen with great periodic predictability. Uh, and there are a certain number of errors that are made over and over and over and over again. And, and so I think that's the problem. And, and the only way I see out of it is you either have to have someone who's well healed enough to buy the technology out and then open source it. Or you have to have a lab that gets created that its fundamental organizing principle is academic and scientific and engineering cooperation on an open source platform, uh, blockchain or something, and that anything that is discovered and verified is released in real time and keeps it. And once you have something operational that functions, then that needs to be disclosed, as I mentioned, through all kinds of creative efforts because uh, the corrupting influence of folks who want to keep this quiet. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of investigative reports that have proven how various cartels and corporate interests can submarine uh, 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 technology that's going to be a threat. Uh, I mean, you know, don't take my word. The, the, the Federation of American Scientists uh, about a decade or 12 years ago came out with a report of over 5,000 patents that had been seized under national security orders. And one of them was something that sounds so trivial now that in the 1970s, 50 years ago, would have just been a very high efficiency solar panel, more efficient than anything that was out there. But it would have competed with the price point of oil and coal and, and gas and power from your power company. What was this, and so this, that I know, yeah, I know you don't have the patent at hand, but what, what is this that I can it's look It's on up? our website. It's in the movies. It's everywhere we have everything. Please read. Um, you know, you wave your hand and say that, well, where is it? It's the, Ameri the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, Stephen Aftergood is the guy who authored it. It's a paper. Read it. 2010, it came out. 20, October 2010. So we're 12 years ago. So um, it's there. We published it. You know, you know, the fact that you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, you act like I'm not you saying that it. it's not there. I'm just saying for no, the record. No, it's your attitude. I'm telling you your attitude is like, I am, where is it? I said, it's there. I'm telling you everything I'm telling you is there. It's out there in open source. Let's, let's so, just um, some some positive testimony yeah. you've had. Um, you know, you were talking about strategizing earlier and how, um, you you know, you, you've uh, built bridges with a lot of really great celebrities who can get the word out and things like this. One of those people um, historically was was Tom DeLonge, who, who helped with To The Stars <laughs> and things like that. And you, you guys mm -hmm. used to be chummy. And I kind of wanted to ask, you know, what, mm -hmm. what happened between you and Tom? Why did you drift apart? Well, we didn't. He got intercepted by some folks who had sort of brainwashed him of the alien threat narrative, uh, General McCaskill at Wright-Patterson and other people. And uh, he got read, led by his nose down that primrose path. And then, of course, he had all kinds of, of, of dark players like Elizondo and uh, uh, Simi Van, uh, Jim Simi Van, who's CIA, and other people kind of circle around him. And I think he just got used and abused and then dumped, which I had predicted would happen. Uh, it was unfortunate. Uh, but the, the problem with having a little bit of knowledge in this area, it's very easy to get manipulated by these sort of uh, professional counterintelligence operatives. So uh, when my, what I saw happen is that uh, Tom kind of got intercepted because they saw him as someone who could be a front man to open up this with a certain narrative to a very specific demographic, you know, younger people and that, um, with, with this sort of, these are a threat to the national security. And oh, by the way, we don't know what they are. But of course we do know what they are. We put out a film last year called The Cosmic Hoax that documents how all this was done. Um, but I think that in his case, uh, I, I actually don't, uh, it was quite some years. I mean, he's had come out and stayed at my house out here in Virginia 
in the mountains at near University of Virginia. And, and I'd been at his place and we did some things, but that was, I'm trying to think early 2000s or what have you. Um, so I just think that what happened and, and he mentioned some of this to me when we were out there, he had a, I think it was a, a girlfriend or uh, at the time whose uncle was involved in these projects. And I think he started getting targeted to get pulled away from, you know, actually staying on a, an accurate path. And he got intercepted uh, by counterintelligence people who are very good at, at doing that, because that that's one of the real problems is that if they look like you could be an asset to be of some value, then there's going to be an attempt to pull you over uh, uh, and, and, and feed you false information, but also false narratives. But he was predisposed to that anyway, the whole alien invasion thing, which I always find laughable. Any scientist, you know, oh, yes, you're coming from another star system with technologies 100,000 years past what we have. And they, they're invading us how, where? Uh, the whole thing is ludicrous. Um, but it's, of course, how you would build the future of the military and industrial and financial complex around another enemy, because I think that's what exactly what Werner von Braun shared with Carol Rosen on his deathbed. This has been a long-term uh, defense plan to sort of present a threat from out there where the world can get united, but instead of in peace, it's going to get united through another boogeyman we all need to fight. Because ultimately, the public is controlled through fear and demagoguery, and, and this is the ultimate demagoguery and fear, in my opinion. Just for the record... I apologize if my attitude is dismissive. I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. And when I ask mm -hmm. for evidence or for a paper, I do that with everyone, including Avi Loeb. Mm -hmm. He said that so and so came from outside well, the solar system. I didn't so how do you know? I didn't bring a five hundred thousand page archive in here to hold up every time you ask about something. But I've given people the resources. Go and find it. Um, you know. Um, now, eventually, what we want to do with this is a PDF searchable archive where all this will be. You know, you put in boom, and it comes up. That'd be great. But, yeah. yeah. So you guys, since you guys are rich podcasters, can help fund that. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, I'm just going to throw yeah, we're, a question. We're, we're from, talking what, you know, 500000 to a million dollars to create that. Uh, this one's from uh, Abdelaziz uh, Atayb. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, thank you so much, Dr. Rhea. God bless you and keep on doing <laughs> what you're doing. It's very important. He asks, what is your answer to the people who accuse you of doing things like fake and CE5 events with flares and who complain about charging a lot of money for your CE5 events? Well, actually, anyone can do CE5 with a, an app that took 20 years to develop that's on all the, uh, the stores. So it's like $9 or something. So most of which goes to the app developers and, and the uh, Apple. But so you don't have to come with me to anything. You can do it yourself. Um, so that's just a ridiculous. Moreover, on the YouTube channel, all that information is there. Now, the events we do um, fund the disclosure project and what we're doing. So I live on $90,000 a year. That's a big pay cut from 600,000 a year as the chairman of emergency medicine. How much of a pay cut? Ask this guy how much pay cut he's taken. When other people take a 80% pay cut to do this work, they can then talk to me. Um, so otherwise, just say thanks. Now, the reality is if you're going to run an organization, that has expenses, you're going to have to charge for things, you know? And so this is one of these really stupid questions, in my opinion, is like, I have been advised that everything I'm doing should be 10 times more costly than they are. But almost 90 plus percent of everything we've ever done has been done for free and is out there in the public for free. Um, and that is not the way to build, you know, financially an organization that's taken on what we are. It's why we don't have any paid staff or an office. So in reality, uh, you know, we just did a workshop. Well, it cost $150,000 with today's inflation to engage the venue. And they made us buy all kinds of food for the, the attendees. And it was $150,000. So I don't have someone saying we will underwrite the cost of everything. So you can do these things for pr people for free. Now, maybe the person asking that question is a billionaire who can underwrite the expenses for all these events. And if he is, great, have, have him give him a call. Otherwise, in the real world, let's talk real world, 
in the real world, you're not going to be able to put on, uh, have an organization uh, and do something like the Disclosure Project. Or if I have to bring uh, some top secret military whistleblowers in and it's at my expense, I do not ask the government to pick up this expense. Where is that going to come from? My retirement savings? So, yes, there are fees. There are fees I have an idea of where the that. money can come from. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. So, again, the, um, please. Go, at, go ask I'm, Elon. I'm, if you have a way of getting free energy or you know someone who, who does, you can set up a Bitcoin farm because one of the most costly aspects is the mm -hmm. e electricity. Mm -hmm. And then you can fund as much research as you like or at least a significant mm -hmm. portion of it. So is there? are you looking into that? Is there a reason that... I don't have... I don't have one of those devices. You didn't hear me. Let me repeat it again. We have investigated and seen that they're all entrapped in a team of people, the inventor and his team, that are wanting to keep it secret. Um, now, one of them that we recently vi visited, in fact, was running Bitcoin mining machines. And that's how he was... That. In fact, there was one little shed that it, it was in, and that's what he was using it for. He was mining <laughs> Bitcoin. So, yeah, so certainly that could be done. Um, but I don't actually own or possess one of those systems. You know, I mean, if we did, that'd be the least important way of generating revenue. I think that there's actually uh, billions of dollars available uh, from people who do want to have an environmental solution that would flow into any operation that could widely uh, prove. But here's the other problem. If you're not willing to open it up to scientific scrutiny, it isn't going to be taken seriously. You know, all right. So that's why, like with the disclosure project, I say, don't take my word for it. Here are these 5,000 documents. Here are these dozens of military witnesses. Here's this. Now, if you have a device, you, you can't make a claim uh, that's this grand claim that it's doing this. And there's nobody who's a third party entity that's credible who has reproduced it or checked it. So a lot of times they want to go straight from the invention to trying to monetize it. And there are all these other steps. And the, uh, the big one is the open disclosure of it, open source, but also the scientific recreation of it by independent people who don't have an ax to grind, aren't trying to raise money. So that is something that always sh should happen in science, but that has not happened properly with this because a friend of mine who's a venture capital guy, he said, there's a direct relationship between how important the invention is and how crazy the inventors get. <laughs> so when you when you've hit something like the gold, the, the brass, the golden ring here, and that it becomes they become more and more erratic because they know what they have and they know what its value should be. And so it, that sort of bloodlust overwhelms the logical mind. Uh, and, the, and the scientific mind. And they feel like they're against everyone or it's them against the world. In reality, the whole world would be with them. One of the things I point out, there are a relatively tiny number of people on the planet that benefit from the status quo of how the planet is running. But there's 99.99% or more of the population that would be behind you if you would open it up and disclose it. And then money isn't going to be an issue because if it's disclosed open source and it's proven by independent, I mean, look, if someone makes a claim like that, they put all the information out, there will probably be a hundred different labs and people who will verify it. I mean, if it's put out faithfully. And you know, unfortunately, a lot of these people put out everything but the secret sauce. So I know, I know of a couple of patents out there, like Stan Meyer did this, where he put everything but, and he actually falsified the voltages and the hertz and whatnot of his uh, uh, electrical device. And that, of course, caused people to try to reproduce and it wouldn't work. Uh, so I think that these sort of little legal and financial tricks always end up being counterproductive, frankly, to, to what their objective is. Um, anything that keeps it in a small secretive group um, trying to monetize it. I, you, know, you know, my analogy, here's the, my analogy. DARPA created what's something called the internet, <laughs> not Al Gore, but DARPA did. Now, that was done by government. It's sort of, so let's call it open source internet. Everybody can get on the internet, the World Wide Web. We need the equivalent of that 
but it ain't going to come from the government. It's not going to come from an academic institution. We need the equivalent of a, an organ, a, a, a organization that's going to do this research and development on these technologies in an open source way that's shared openly. And the technology, the platform, the initial one, I call this phase one, is widely available. Now, that would not prevent, even if it's a private corporation, from after that initial launch, doing very profound refinement. Let's call it generation 2.0 or 3.0 or 10.0 of the device, um, because that's how science goes forward. You know, eventually, uh, most of these early devices were rotary and electrostatic rotary. All four of the ones that I'm talking about are solid state. They're solid state, no moving parts, you which is beautiful. Question. Yeah. Um, some, some guys in the audience just wanted us to, to just give it like a hard yes or no. Uh, the question I previously asked uh, where someone mentioned about dropping flares, I just want to check. So you refute that claim, like no flares oh, being no, dropped when no, you have a C5. We've never done something like that ever. Uh, now, I do think we've had a few events where people have tried to trick us. <laughs> and that's different. Uh, what do you mean? Where, where they've tried to stage things so that we'd be fooled. As in participants um, that came to your event? So no, no, no. Outside and, and ex, ex, no, outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and we've gotten pretty good of, at, at finding who those, when that happens. But would you like to name and shame? <laughs> people like who, like the government or, or the participants yeah. or what? Well, again, the government, which government? No, the participants who come never would do something like that. Um, but you know, what I'm really encouraging people is to, people to get, get the app at CE5 contact app and do it themselves. You know, I got a great report recently from a truck driver in Croatia who was driving along and doing, it took a break uh, and was doing the CE5 uh, techniques and this uh, ET craft materialized to the left of his cab and floated right over the cab and vanished. And we're getting reports like this from people all over the world. So I tell people, you don't have to be with me. I think if anything, uh, due to the fact that there's a lot of reconnaissance around what I'm doing, you're probably better off if I'm not there. Um, I do like teaching people the concepts and the techniques um, of remote viewing and, and the meditative techniques and what the cosmology is that we're engaging. Uh, and to me, that's like where a big part of this needs to come in is a whole revisiting of the cosmology that it, you know takes it out of a straight line universe um because we're not dealing with the straight line universe we're dealing with a quantum holographic conscious universe and uh that's a, that's a very different kettle of fish when you start dealing with civilizations who certainly understand that and their technologies are utilizing aspects of that so um to me that's really exciting i like it's still the thing that i love doing the most actually but um but, you know, there's a limit how much time I can take to do those. So I'm encouraging other people to do it. And, you know, it's not difficult to do, actually. Is the, is the app 100% required or are there other methods that people can use? Well, if you, don't, if you know what you're doing, you don't need the app. If you okay. are trying to learn about it, get the app. So it's like a I shortcut, mean, essentially, like a bit of guidance. Oh yeah, it's a whole. So it's like a meditation program. app. You like just like some people don't know how to meditate. They're like, just get an app and and like, no, it's more than that. It's like, how do you set up the group? What equipment do you have? What you know? How do you do different satellites from other objects? No, it's a whole training program. Oh yeah. Okay, so I personally would love to speak to Bob Lazar. I request him frequently. Well, we'll see what happens. But anyway, what are your? I'm, and I'm always getting people's different opinions on on Bob Lazar because people seem he's a divisive figure. So, do you happen to have any stories about Bob Lazar? Anything that you've heard? Any opinions on him? Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's something that is a one since I'm up the street from the White House right now at my place in Washington. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, "Small minds talk about people. Mediocre minds talk about events." Great minds talk about ideas. So um, I'm not someone to get into sort of, you know, the gossip mill of talking about personalities. It's not important. What I will say is there are assets there where he was located. I wasn't there with him, nor have I gotten anyone to corroborate his exact story. But I have people who have corroborated related uh, facilities and assets that are there. 
The ones that are underground are the extraterrestrial vehicles. Above ground, there are places where we are storing or building the man-made UFOs. Um, and so we certainly know where those are and how they're configured and which areas out by Pahoot Mesa and other, other locations. Um, I have a colonel who's coming forward who was an early U-2 spy plane pilot but who had been assigned to work with the Skunk Works, Lockheed Skunk Works, and was, had been Rich's cell number and was also at the so-called Area 51 facility uh, observing this. So, you know, it's not implausible that he was there. Um, uh, but since I wasn't there with him and I don't know anyone who was there with him, I just have to, you know, take his account and put it into the matrix of, I call it a mosaic where you're putting, <laughs> I'm trying to put together a mosaic from a, a million data points and, and 1100 people, credible people who've been in facilities. And then what you look for are corroboration, points of corroboration and data points that line up. Um, so some, some of what he's recounted would conform with the fact that those assets are there um, to the extent that his physics theories about how it operated. Uh, I'm not so sure if those are accurate only because they've never been tested. And moreover, um, he was there for such a short period of time as a young guy. I don't think he would have been read into that. Um, I, I'm not sure if that was just, one of the things I'm always worried about is that when they're onboarding you into these projects, they will give you a certain amount of information, exposure, and disinformation to uh, deliberately. Uh, it's a testing. Pro it's a testing process. I know what the procedures are. How, how do you manage uh, that, uh, Dr. Greer? With with because there's like you say there's a lot of elements that are trying to pour out misinformation disinformation mm -hmm. and we each have our kind of our, our tests for what passes through our filter. What what's yours? If I find somebody is providing something that is factually inaccurate, then they are dismissed from the project. It's a very strict, um, you know, rule. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but when we were doing the briefings for members of Congress. In 97, the private briefings that we were doing prior to the disclosure project in 01, uh, there was a guy who came who some of his story checked out, and then he started telling embellished aspects of it, and we escorted him out of the facility because it was completely too risky. Um, what you find, the other thing I have found is some people who have seen one little piece of something, they then Google the internet or talk to other people, and they start embellishing um, from, you know, the rubbish that's on the internet. And believe me, on this subject, it's 90 plus percent nonsense. So uh, at least, uh, and so, and in fact, the algorithms push the nonsense and the truth gets left behind um, because salacious, gossipy nonsense is what gets pushed to the front of all the uh, internet platforms because it's clickbait for ad revenue. You know, that's how Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, all of them work that way. So uh, that is, that's a real... And that's just the process you have to go through. Now, you know, like the guys that are surfacing, I said, well, give me your DD-214s and let's check out who you were. And I have some people who help investigate their background. Um, and oh, you can do all that. And then at some point, if the person has become an aficionado of the UFO subject, after they left a command or after they were working on something, they may start dragging into their narrative this, this, you know, sort of this cesspool of gossip and nonsense and conjecture. So I think one of the things we have to be very careful of is always say, what did you see? I'm very hard nosed about this. What did you personally see or know about and learn when you were in that facility or when you were working on this project? I'm not interested in your theories of the universe, no offense. And I'm not interested in what you've dredged up from other people third hand. So you want to, you have to be very disciplined. And I, because I have a responsibility because I'm handing this off to key people in, in DC that it's, let's just stick to what, you know, I, we don't need conjecture. Um, and it's not your job to do the assessment. It's, it's our job to do the assessment after we have, you know, thousands of data points and, and evidence and information. So it's very hard. A lot of people, because they, they get a lot of attention from um, something that's an amazing 
event they witnessed or a place they saw. And it's very easy for human nature then to say, well, <laughs> now let me add to it this and this and this because it's exciting and it kind of keeps the buzz going. Um, and, and I think we, that's what we have to be very careful of in this field because it is very sensational and uh, it's easy to get on that slippery slope where people you know, combine and commingle what they directly knew and what the facts are with other information that's speculative or embellished. So I think with all of these sort of uh, whistleblowers and witnesses, it's we have to be prudent, and careful about that, which I try to be. That's good to know. Um, in 1994, Dr. Ray Bush and, uh, if I'm saying that right, and Linda Moulton Ho heard from two men who who showed uh, Dr. Ray Bush identification from the Department of Defense. They claimed that in certain black programs, we were communicating with non-human entities trying to control them and exploit information provided by said non-human entities on mind control weapons. Uh, but these alleged Department of Defense sources instead felt that the non-human entities were controlling and manipulating us, and we were a big issue for humanity. Can you add any of, of your own information to that? And if any, let us know if any technology related to advanced propulsion and flight was gleaned from these non-human sources and through any black programs. And do you feel that these non-human entities may be manipulating humanity um, and that our black tech is so advanced that we can see things that we can't see with our eyes. Well, there's a whole bunch of issues all at once. Certainly there are technologies that we can see that we don't have to have our eyes to see it. Um, uh, the microscope, for example, and the telescope, uh, but also transdimensional systems. We know that uh, my military advisor, one of them was at the White Oaks Naval Facility in the 70s, and there was a machine console that was, would, was able to extract from what they call the white noise of space-time, uh, anything that happened or is happening at that moment at any point in space or happened uh, last year or a thousand years ago or a million years ago. And that was almost 50, I think it was 74 or 73, something like that. So we know that those technologies exist, whether there are these uh, entities that are behind that, it's titillating and salacious, and I, I have not seen evidence of it, except to the extent that there are definitely non-extraterrestrial. When they say non-human, that doesn't mean extraterrestrial. So this is where there's this whole big confusion. It's like if, it, not everything that goes bump in the night is an extraterrestrial. I mean, there's such a thing as poltergeist. Um, you know, I've seen things in the ER that would blow people's minds when someone has died suddenly and, and violently. Um, so I, I think that it, it sounds like there's a great story there. Would you mind elaborating a little bit? Oh, it was this one of these bizarre things where this man had been uh, can't remember, stabbed or shot. Anyway, he came in code blue and flatline. We tried to save him and we couldn't. And he then was taken. He was in the trauma room one and then it was taken down to the morgue. Um, and about three or four in the morning, I'm out in the center of, of, with my nurses and all of a sudden that in room is totally empty. Cabinets fly open, IV bags are being hurled on the floor, uh, EKG machine is turning on by itself. It was clearly an, this, this guy, very angry and was on a rampage in, in, in that little room. And of course, the nurses and I looked at each other and says, we're not going to put this in the chart, but, um, you know, you see things like this periodically. So one of the problems with the whole UFO subculture, and I think this is, this is done deliberately, in my opinion, is this conflation of everything that's not human. It's either human or alien. So I never used the word alien. Alien to me are all kinds of phenomena. Extraterrestrial may be one of them. Uh, non-corporeal entities uh, or an entity from another dimension that isn't extraterrestrial, meaning an even an extraterrestrial biological entity from a star system and a physical star system and planet. But there are other dimensions. And so there can be all kinds of phenomena that begin to be observed and under certain conditions, very physically in this dimension, uh, having an effect that isn't extraterrestrial. And so this is why I keep getting back to this central point that we have to develop a new cosmology. I wrote a paper in the early 90s called ETs and the New Cosmology, 
where we have to develop this sort of a whole phyla, like, you know, your biological, phy- you know, the, the groupings of families of plants and animals dealing with the cosmos, because it is not just a physical 3D cosmos. There are these other dimensional uh, aspects and beings and intelligences from other dimensions. But the, where it gets very tricky is that if you are an interstellar civilization, you're not getting from point A to B at the speed of light. You go beyond the speed of light, there's res- that resonance and frequency, you're moving into another dimension and you're traversing other dimensions. So there are, there, from a, just in a phenomenological point of view, what you might observe, a lot of what's extraterrestrial may look very similar to a poltergeist event and vice versa <laughs> and vice going the other way. So this is where knowledge is power. And uh, you have to have, I think, a certain amount of knowledge about all these different distinct phenomena, plural, to understand what part of it is man-made, which is very important. I mean, 70 years and trillions of dollars in black funding, they have the ability to do things that would look very much like it's alien. That's what abductions are and mutilations are. About cattle mutilations, I'm always interested. Mm -hmm. Why are they associated with the craft? I don't know. I I don't have a, like even a hypothesis on that. Mm -hmm. So what do do you think about cattle mutilations? Well, I, I, I do it based on the science that Dr. Altshuler, whose stuff was ripped off by the charlatans in the UFO subculture, uh, he did the original Snippy, the horse case in Colorado. And he was a hematologist, pathologist, very good friend of mine. He was also, by the way, the nephew of General Jimmy Doolittle, who went over to investigate Foo Fighters for Roosevelt and came back and said, sir, those are interplanetary vehicles. But at any rate, he uh, lived in Denver. And uh, he's passed away now. He got cancer and died. But he was one of the very early scientists looking into this. And he concluded it was a highly classified human uh, deceptive, false flag, deceptive indication and warning. Uh, And, of course, we knew that was the case. And when people see, quote, unquote, a UFO around one of these events, well, which UFO? An interstellar one or one out of the Lockheed Skunk Works? Um, I think that there is this, again, everyone assumes that anything going on there with this kind of phenomenon has to be something we don't understand this mysterious. It's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz being behind the curtain, pulling all the levers, scaring the crap out of Dorothy and the Scarecrow. Um, They have the ability to stage things that look very alien that aren't. And as you know, Jacques Vallée has a Dr. Belay has a, a document from the CIA from 1985 describing the CIA program of, quote, unquote, staging alien abductions in uh, Brazil and Argentina for its psychological warfare purpose. Now, you know, I have a number of men on my team who actually have been operationally, tactically involved in those programs. So if you have people with the intention to deceive the public, and particularly the gullible UFO community, then what happens is that there can easily stage mutilations and easily stage abductions and easily stage all kinds of things. Um, And people are going to not be asking the question, you know, is is it real or is it staged? So the very first thing when I hear something, uh, now I didn't know this when I first started the project in 1990, but as I gotten methods and sources and assets who have been involved with this. And in this case, now there are documents that, you know, this is a big problem because if, if they can taint how people view the subject and what the database is uh, by including a lot of staged events that are human for their psychological warfare value, you then have to go back to all your cases and database and start over. You really have to look at everything with a fresh look. Uh, and then you throw in one more confusing element, and that is this whole interdimensional question of entities, quote unquote, or intelligences that are neither human nor extraterrestrial that could be in the play. And so, you know, this people don't like this because people like, you know, simple Hollywood movie type narratives. But uh, it is complex. And, and I think that I don't think it's beyond what people can understand. But I just think that it's not usually talked about. You will go to very few conferences on this subject 
where the whole question of the cosmology and all the different phenomena that could be man-made versus extraterrestrial versus, quote, alien. I use the word alien really to not denote extraterrestrial so much as what's being foisted on the public as extraterrestrial. Um, and I think that's done very deliberately because if you can misdirect people, you know, there's a guy I worked with years ago who was the right-hand guy for General Odom, who is the director of the National Security Agency. And after he left that position, he worked with me and helped analyze documents and stuff. Um, so he knew what things should look like. Uh, it's particularly the documents that would come to me that are not officially declassified, that are still top secret that, that we have. And so, but he told me, he says, yes, what we do is called a DDT. I said, oh, that's the, like the, in the poison, the, you know, the whatever it was, the, the insecticide. He says, yes, but it's not what it stands for. You set up a decoy, you distract people, and you trash their efforts. DDT. He says, we run DDTs on people all the time. Um, and so if you're sort of like an academic person. Have you ever had person, one run on you? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. More than once. I mean, I. Well, you know, the, the, the night after I, I met with, um, uh, I was meeting with the crown prince of Liechtenstein, Prince Hans Adam von Liechtenstein. And uh, of course, he was trying to convince me of the evil alien narrative so that we could have World War III that would bring Christ back on a flying saucer. I mean, that was this whole end of the world eschatological Armageddon sort of. Speaking of, of World the, War III, uh, I want to ask you a Ukrainian UAP question. So I'm just putting yeah. that out there. Continue, mm -hmm. please. But that, but so that night when I didn't buy into it, this was in July of 1994, I was targeted with one of these systems. And it was one that was trying to abduct me out of the, my hotel room in St. Moritz Hotel. And luckily I, I, I identified it right away as a directional energy weapon that was attempting to, to do this. Um, but, you know, that with that sort of nonsense has been played on people for decades remember we took in havana syndrome dr Gordon? yes well okay. way beyond that i mean the havana okay. syndrome stuff would be the very tip of an iceberg of uh, electromagnetic warfare systems that are more trans-dimensional and that are uh dealing with more scalar longitudinal type uh, energy and uh, so-called psychotronic radionic but very advanced versions of it um, and those those are what are used often and deployed along with other means uh, during abduction sequences by these human uh, well, criminals. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm saying to these folks here in Washington, I said, you have to understand you're going to uncover the largest RICO in the world, racketeering influence, corrupt organization. Uh, and they have technologies and, and the means to, to to make a lot of trouble. And you have to approach this carefully so the whole system doesn't get blown to pieces. But, but they have these abilities, and I describe them. I go from the sort of easy-to-understand anti-gravity device floating over the desert that looks like an alien ship that came out of underground at Dugway that's made by Northrop Grumman or something versus, you know, these really esoteric trans-dimensional systems that are man-made and that can stage and deceive people quite easily. Um, and they're very good at this, by the way. I, you know, and they've been perfecting it from the 50s. In the early days, they used uh, short stature guys with made them up in Hollywood type things on board uh, man-made craft and then would engage in abductions using so a canister, some knockout chemical and what have you. But as they develop more and more capabilities in these electronic warfare systems, they then also created these sort of robotic, what look like aliens, <laughs> the, the greys. And, you know, I know a number of guys, mm -hmm, but very, very, at the level of almost a nano bio machine uh, type of thing. And those are, those are what your typical abduction sequence cr critters uh, you know, and, and we know exactly, you know, where they're being made, who's making them, how they make them, how they're deployed. Um, and by the way, th there was an expose on this in the 80s before I got on the scene uh, by a researcher. Uh, but of course, he got booed uh, out of the system because it, it blew up everyone's uh, belief system of the good and the bad aliens and 
Uh, you know, they, look, they want everyone to be addicted to some other narrative to replace racism and uh, division on the planet. They want the humans to be united, but against an alien threat. It's a, it's a very simple narrative. Um, and it's what demagogues have done, you know, for thousands of years to consolidate power. But this is on a much larger scale than just the British staging, you know, and, and, and uh, setting up the Maoris fighting against each other in New Zealand so that they could go in the breach and conquer New Zealand. So, uh, th- you know, this is a much more sophisticated, high tech version of that. But that's but that's been a, a strategy that uh, uh, military planners have done for thousands of years. But in this case, you're dealing with some very advanced technologies quite capable of deceiving almost everyone involved. And that's that's a problem because ultimately what that creates uh, is, is, you know, how do you begin to ha- do you have to set up a system where anything that happens goes through a whole analysis of, uh, you know, is it this, this, this or this? And, there, you know, there's a whole set of things that might be. And I don't see that people are doing that. It's a little bit I liken this to a doctor. Someone comes in with chest pain and they're so poorly trained, they have to conclude it's a heart attack and treat them for a heart attack when it could be a dissecting thoracic aneurysm or pleurisy or a pulmonary embolus or I mean, it could be a hundred things. It could be all kinds of things. So um, what we have in, in this subject right now is a crisis in analytics and knowledge and information because the. The, the truth is the strangest things are real and many of them are human in origin. Uh, now, there are the high strangeness aspects of the ET uh, events and there are the high strangeness nature of the interdimensional events, the sort of the Montauk type scenario. Earlier, when, when talking about the Havana syndrome, you used the word scalar yeah, that, that stuck out to me. Do you mind expanding on that? Well, you know, it, there, there are, it, we look at an electromagnetic signal as a, it's a wave, right? It's propagating at 186,000 miles per second. Um, and so the speed of light is, that's what speed of light is, 186,000 miles every second. But it's a waveform. But the scalar and longitudinal are actually a point that goes out longitudinally without the wave. In other words, it's a signal without the wave. And therefore, it propagates at significantly greater velocity than the conventional uh, speed of light. But it also can be weaponized. Now, one of the problems, the whole reason this whole modern era of of UFO events happened is that when we began to detonate thermonuclear weapons and atomic weapons, everyone knows about the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse. What they don't know is that attendant to that, that is usually not, we didn't have the instruments to detect it. Is, is a big pulse that actually disrupts transdimensionally ET communications and transportation in other worlds. In other words, it tears the universe in a way that's very destructive because of that big pulse is, has a tendon to it, one of these scalar type uh, fre- frequencies. And it's, it's very, can be very destructive. So that's why all of a sudden there were all these ET craft around Los Alamos and uh, the Trinity site, the White Sands, and in particular, Roswell. People forget that the only place that we had nuclear weapons, atomic weapons, actually at that time in 1947 on Earth was the Roswell Army Air Base. And that's why the ET craft were there. We had hidden in a new radar dome, uh, electromagnetic, one of these directional energy weapons in there that scrambled those craft and uh, uh, three of them crashed from the best our count. Uh, two of them were recovered right away. One was blown to smithereens, one continued further west. And there was another one that I think was not found till uh, 1950 or 51, more in the Northwest the mountains of New Mexico. Um, but that all, if you, if you look at the testimony of Colonel Diedrichson, who back in those days in the 60s on, he was the head of all the Atomic Energy Commission, now Department of Energy, atomic facilities and military. He was an Air Force colonel. And he said, oh, yes, every single one of our atomic processing plants, uh, uranium, uh, uh, weapon storage areas, uh, launch missile facilities had been surveyed, surveilled by 
these extraterrestrial vehicles because they were such great concern to not only what they could do to this planet, but when they're detonated, they actually are incredibly disruptive. They kind of rip the fabric of the universe. That that makes it very foreboding if the UAP is seen, being seen over Ukraine at the moment. What do you think of that? What, what do you think? Are they attracted to conflict? Are they trying to prevent a disaster, a potential World War III event? Or Honestly, I, I have seen just what you've seen, that picture and information. I don't have any other information. I do know that wherever there's a big risk of, of that, something like that happening, they're going to be concerned and observing it because they not only know the damage it can cause on Earth, but they know the damage it can cause elsewhere. Because again, everyone's, everyone's still living in a straight line Newtonian world. They think what happens on this little planet here has no effect on a distant star system or galaxy. And that's simply not true when you start getting into non-locality and entanglement and the entangled universe, but on a macro scale. So, you know, it's one of these things where we stumbled across this in the 40s and 50s with atomic and thermonuclear weapons, but we didn't know what kind of hornet's nest was getting kicked. Um, so that's a very serious problem. And every military intelligence person I know who's been read into this problem knows what I'm telling you about that. But that would make sense why, you know, you have, you have, you know, Putin rat, rattling his saber saying he's has, because we dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's a precedent for him to use weapons, at least at smaller tactical battlefield size ones, um, if he, his country is threatened. Uh, and now since they, he sort of set up a scam thing to annex part of Ukraine, now anything that happens in that part is an invasion of the motherland of Russia. Therefore, we can use nuclear weapons. So very dangerous. Um, so it would not surprise me, therefore, that there would be both extraterrestrial and human advanced aircraft in there. Meaning, seems- meaning the man-made the man-made UFOs as well as the ET ones. It seems that a lot of the control for the disclosure process is actually in the hands of the others, whoever they may be, you know, the whole range of them. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, just, you, you know, the phenomena at large. Um, no, the no, no, that's not true. That is not true. No, They're you didn't say for- so? No, I, I was I just going to ask why, why you think they wouldn't reveal mm-hmm. themselves en masse around the world and kind of end this process, you know? Well, because you know, it's a little corny. It's like the prime directive. First of all, if they were to do that, it would induce worldwide panic because there'd be no context. It would be portrayed as an alien invasion because you, everyone you know, the media, every movie, Independence Day, uh, all the invasion, you know, alien from Ridley Scott, all this is going to kick into people's subconscious to the fore. Uh, And they know that this is not how it should happen. It should happen that humans tell the truth about it (laughs) for once in our lives, tell the truth, deal with it directly, educate each other, and begin to make peaceful contact with them in a rational way. If they were to do that, could they do that? Of course. I mean, they could do something that'd be boom, it'd be over. Could they take out every weapon system we have instantly? Yes. But this is not the way uh, advanced civilizations interact with a primitive one which is humans. I mean, we're not a level one yet. We're a level zero civilization. So, you know, they're not going to do that because the other problem is if there's that kind of intervention externally, then we don't evolve. We don't learn the lessons. We don't learn what we have to learn um, to become a a more evolved socially, spiritually, and materially uh, as an advanced civilization. Because it's almost like I have raised four children. Now we have our 12th grandchild on the way. If every time that ch- every, if every time that child was about to fall when it's learning to walk, you stopped it and held it, it would never learn to walk. So, so, so it's, it's, that's a, a, it's a simplistic analogy to sort of a cosmic perspective of a civilization coming from an agrarian, early industrial, and now bang, we hit this threshold of advanced science and physics. But Unfortunately, our technologies have gotten ahead of our social and spiritual development, meaning that, you know, we're not socially and spiritually developed enough to have these technologies and not first use them in a war or in a weapon system like a thermonuclear weapon. So this becomes to be a real problem because the the extinction level events that wipe out and have wiped out prior civilizations 
is when the technologies get ahead of, of the social and spiritual evolution and development of the people of that planet. So that's where this is another theme that keeps recurring, is that there has to be the development of consciousness, the development socially and spiritually. But the problem right now is we're running out of time for it to happen sequentially. It has to all happen kind of at once because we're, we're headed over this cliff with the biosphere and the environment and a lot of other problems, including the risk of thermonuclear war. So this is we're at the crux of a huge pivotal inflection point in, in human evolution. And we really have to figure out how we're going to manage that. So that's, that's why I left my medical career, is to try to see if we could f- fix it before it's too late. Given that these beings are said to be able to work through cognitive manipulation and that mm-hmm. level of advancement, um, how can we be sure that what we're presented by them is real, that they don't have ulterior motives? And just to add on to that, do, do you think that all of the others are benevolent so that there's a range? Um, and just because we're touching on the CE5 things here, I just wanted to ask if you think there'll ever be a chance for a CE5 peer review. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, people can r- review what we have done and what we put out already. Um, what I think in terms of your other question is if the, the people who are really addicted to the idea that there is the whole, you know, cowboys and Indians, uh, good name, bad aliens, they don't seem to understand that what part of that assessment is coming from staged events that are deceptive indication and warnings or false flag. Um, and I think it's very simple to slip into this because humans always like to have that drama of us versus them. I mean, look at how divided our country is politically. It, that is something that people feed on that. So how much of that is sort of an acculturation and, and a sort of a brainwashing and how much of it is uh, objectively real? Now, having done thousands of hours with thousands of people doing CE5 all over the world and having all kinds of contact experiences, I see no evidence that any of them are hostile or malevolent in any way, shape, or form. All the things that have happened that have been disturbing in that way have been man-made copycat, you know, sort of copycat alien stuff. So my objective analysis of it is I don't, I don't see that that's the case. Another sort of intellectual analysis of it, and that's just empirical, the experience we've had. So, you know, a lot of people sit in their their houses Googling the Internet and they think they know what they're doing, but they never go out and try to make contact or observe something in real time. Um, But so in in doing that now for decades, I don't see any evidence that any of them are hostile. I do think that there have been a number of staged events that would make people conclude that they were. Uh, like the, the terrible burn victims in the Cash Landrum case, which was our covert Air Force operations out of Nellis flying an extraterrestrial vehicle we had captured, and they put a nuclear a, a, a reactor on it because they couldn't quite figure out the, the energy generating part of it, and it was being flown, and it malfunctioned, and radioactive junk was failing on, on Betty Cash and Landrum, and they were hospitalized, and that whole area, the road had to be dug up twice to get rid of all the radioactivity that was there. But that was a human mishap of a test flight of an extraterrestrial vehicle. But they were happy for the media and the public to say that aliens are poisoning us with radio. You know, see what I'm saying? Yeah, so you, it was monkeys you, with microwaves, not extraterrestrials. Yeah. And so this is one of the real problems is that you have to have, you know, I, I tend to take a very um skeptical view of a, of a facile, a sort of superficial analysis of that until you can get to the root information from the people who were there, what actually happened here. Um, and I, I think there are many cases like that. So things that have led to these grand conspiracy theories um, and fear mongering, uh, I think so many of them are staged or misperceptions of human events. And so I think we have to be before we start jumping into the Will Smith and Independence Day, let's kick alien butt category, I think we need to, you know, be a little more rational and deliberative. And this is why I don't see any evidence that there is a, a hostile or malevolent extraterrestrial group out there. I think there are some rather troublesome interdimensional beings. 
you know, this is good. You get to some of these people who work in these spooky programs that are doing uh, Satan worship and devil worship and all kinds of scary stuff. So where does love, faith, and goodness enter into this? It's, it's the heart of it. <laughs> it's the heart of it. I mean, um, in my opinion, going forward as a civilization, higher consciousness and love and approaching all of this with a, a wisdom that prevents us from getting pulled into these manipulative narratives is, is really key. But that's the heart in the higher consciousness, being able to discern. I mean, part of it's intellectual, but a lot of it's the heart. And ultimately, this is, I think, these visitors from other star systems are very interested in the human capabilities in that regard, particularly consciousness and feeling and heart. Um, and I think, you know, the, the breakthrough where they found 30 or 40,000 neurons in the human heart. So there's this resonance between mind and heart of feeling and consciousness that we can develop. And that ultimately gives you the ability to see and know and discern accurately uh, that you can't just intellectually in, in, in the intellect and the ego. So I think that's really the guiding star. That's the, that's the North Star is the development of higher consciousness and also it being connected to um, love of the, the universe, of the planet, and of each other so that our actions are guided by that, not just by base greed and avarice or hatred or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, people who want to you know, maintain control and manipulate the population, the love and peace don't cut it. I mean, they need to have ways to get people riled up like at a football game in opposing teams. And that's just another dysfunctional uh, power dynamic on Earth that has to get uh, addressed and fixed. But ultimately, that's each of us individually have to fix that. Yeah, that's a that's a I am running. I have another hard meeting. I'm a little bit over. Uh, well, thank you for spending so much time. It's an honor. And I thank you because I, I, we went over time. So thank you. Yeah, you know, we did. We did. Thank I you. just I just saw that it's almost 420. Oh, 420. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, before we go, uh, <laughs> some people keep saying, so what's your opinion on Richard Doty? Do you want to just answer that? And then we can close with a positive message about love. Mm -hmm. Like something practical, like what should everyone watching do? So what are your opinions on Doty? And then close on love. Well, I mean, he's a counterintelligence. He's put out a lot of disinformation, but he's also, we were able to get a certain amount of really important information out of him, which you can see on our um, channel, our YouTube channel. Uh, and he was able to confirm that they were doing human abductions and that he was able to confirm that they were paying off and bribing the media. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that in his uh, later years, he's been trying to put out some valuable sort of information about that, um, which I think many people who've been involved in some of these dark arts and nefarious activities, at some point, they do kind of want to let some of the truth come out before they get too old. Um, as far as, you know, how people can help, I hope you guys will all go to the lostcenturyfilm.com and help us get the crowdfunding in place. We're already in production on this documentary film. We hope it comes out in the spring, maybe April or May. Hard to predict that with Hollywood. But, um, and we really want it to be sort of a big, uh, a big leap forward in terms of human awareness of the, the kind of beautiful world we can have if we can bring these technologies to peaceful use. Because imagine this, in 20 years, by the time my uh, grandchildren are, are uh, having their kids, uh, we would have a world without pollution, without power lines, without poverty globally, and with a sustainable planet, and the release of the technologies that would also clean up the oceans and the land that we've already uh, kind of ruined. So that those are all possible. In fact, the, the very hopeful message I give people is that those sciences and technologies are extant. They're already on the planet, but there has to be a strategy and a, and a groundswell, like a grassroots movement, to bring it forward because uh, it's not going to come out. The, the centers of power never are going to shoot themselves in the foot. So if, it's gonna, if this change is going to happen, it has to come from us little folks 
like you and me that are doing this outside these centers of power. And but if we come together and do it in, in right action and with courage, I think we're going to have in 20 years of an extremely different planet than we have now. The alternative is extinction, frankly. So I, I tell people that uh, whether they're a high net worth person or a scientist, you know, this is a very pressing issue. And if we didn't already have the solution, you, it'd be ha- you, you could uh, be allowed to be despondent. But we do have the solutions. And that's what we want to prove. And well, you'll, you'll see the backbone of the whole film on October 25th if you get on the webinar. Now, uh, unfortunately, the event itself is, is sold out. Yep. And the uh, links so, to that will be in the description. So, and then, oh, great. Yep. Yep. The links to that great. will be in the description. Again, it's, it's Lost Century. The, the Lost Century Film.com. Great, great. And Daniel yeah. has a closing question for you, if you could spend like two more minutes or one minute. Yeah, absolutely. Final question, Stephen. You've been so great. Thank you, Dr. Greer. Yeah. Um, very enlightening, filling a lot of information gaps. So you briefed uh, CIA director Wolsey, um, and he later turned around and said, actually, it wasn't briefing, it was a dinner party, yada, yada, yada. I wanted to ask you, like a number of people have said, I wasn't really briefed. I wanted to ask you, do you know any reason for that discrepancy? Because the subject, they don't want to admit that they had an interest in the subject because the subject has such high social opprobrium, you know, social uh, ridicule. And uh, the other part of it is that they don't want to admit that after they were read in, they were pulled in and then betrayed the country. All right. I'll just be real blunt. So yeah, it is. And it's the truth. Um, luckily, you know, I have the, I have the correspondence and the FedEx that set up the meeting and what the purpose of the meeting was. And I always tell people, look in Washington, how do you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. (laughs) (laughs) So I I looked, I I just shrug and go, yeah, what do you expect? I mean, you know, it's spin, it's, you know, dissembling and uh, disingenuous comments and, and whatnot. It, I just, it doesn't affect me at all because I'm shocked when it doesn't happen. (laughs) <laughs> that's great but Thank you know you. i i share the truth and people may not like the truth uh, it's the truth as i know it and um i do think there's a responsibility of people who who do receive this kind of information to act on it in a way that benefits the the the, the human species but our country and when they don't they have uh, failed to fulfill the duties of their office take care sir i appreciate you going way over time Thank you, Steve. Next time, maybe we can talk about the Wilson docs. There's so many questions about that, but yes, we'll save yeah, that for next fun. time. All right, okay. you guys have a good one. Take care. You right, too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. All right. And Dan, how's that? That was great. Uh, it took a while to find the rhythm, I think, but but I think we got a lot answered and we got a lot of information from Dr. Greer there. Yep. Yep. Justice Bieber was my favorite part. I want to make a hashtag about that. Justice Bieber. I'm, I'm grateful that Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, spent so much time with us. So I'll take this offline. I'm going to place it back online in about 24 hours or so. And it will be edited with better audio and a sponsor message. Like I mentioned, there'll be a sponsor message at 20 minutes and then 40 minutes. They pay the bills. If you don't like that, then you have the option of, of like skipping forward. There's a timestamp. All of them are timestamped. And you can also go to theoriesofeverything.org and be a tow member. You get an you get an ad-free version so so and you support the podcast like thank you thank you either way even just this viewage viewing just you viewing is supporting thank you dan is from that ufo podcast that will also be in the description that if you like the the toe content you'll love that ufo content yeah, I, th- I think people will find a nice crossover between our channels. Um, and Andy conducts the interviews on that UFO podcast that are very much, you know, like this one. We we just ask the question, we let the information come out, and the audience can make up their own minds. All right, we'll stick around for like a couple more minutes and answer any lingering questions from the audience, and then we'll take it off air. Dan, does that, does that sound okay? Yeah. All right. Oh, that sounds great. Okay, let's see. So what do you all think in the, in the chat? I'm curious. How did you like the podcast? It's a little behind for me. Watching the chat throughout, it seemed that everyone, you know, everyone was civil. 
a lot of uh, conversation was going on. Uh, there was a lot of support for Stephen's app as well, uh, the CE5 app, when we were talking about that. Uh, a number of people in the chat use it and vouched for it. Some people are saying that we, we ambushed him, and then some people are saying you didn't ask any hard questions. It's, uh, I mean, that it's, it's tricky. Yeah, you, we're always going to get that, right? Like, yeah. You, you went too far. You didn't go far enough when the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah. You know, good art makes people react. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we ambushed. Dr. Uh, also, our you job. Know, well, at least my, I'm not have... thinking in terms of ambush for anyone. No. I'm not thinking in terms of let me expose someone. I'm thinking in terms of if th this is. I would like to understand what this person is saying. And so, when there are questions, if it seems like an ambush, for instance, he didn't like my hand waving, which is just my gesticulation. I'm sorry, I can't. Sure. I can't help that. But when I have questions in a in a scrupulous manner about some fastidious physics concept, I I don't know what to. I don't know what to do other than ask. And I do that to everyone, John Verveke, Ian McGilchrist, Avi Loeb. Yeah, exactly. And it just gives the person space to elaborate, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I yeah. really enjoyed the part where you and you and Dr. Reeve were talking about the, the in-depth physics of things, because it's not often that someone like Dr. Reeve will come up against someone who has the actual knowledge to kind of dive into it and kind of go, wait, what do you mean by scalar? What do you mean by, you know, vector in this sense? Like, it's, yeah. it's not quite the right word, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or, 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 well, I want to ask about time travel because as soon as he says that so-and-so travels faster than time, then it implies yes. time travel. And also in my mind, just so you know, I'm wondering what I, I'm predicting what he's going to say, which is that, well, you're thinking of it in the standard model and you have to think far outside the model. Well, I, I don't, I don't know what to say about that because just like how he has a checklist for a heart attack, I have a checklist too. And every person has a checklist. Well, yeah, of course. it doesn't mean that of you course. discount the, the, the extraordinary. And, and it does mean that some will slip through and be incorrectly categorized. So that's also true. Okay. All right. That's pretty cool. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out again. Dan is from That UFO Podcast. I'm from Theories of Everything. And if you'd like to support Theories of Everything, visit theoriesofeverything.org. There's no reason. There's no, sorry. There's no, there's no downside if you don't. It's just if you want to support, if you feel like you can. And either way, thank you for coming out. The podcast is finished, and what remains now is just a few minutes of the live chat prior to Steven coming on, where me and Dan Zetterstrom interact with the audience as we await Greer with bated breath. Uh, so I can see that Joseph has already asked, is that him off that UFO podcast? Uh, yeah, mm. Yes, yes, it is. Hi. <laughs> this is Dan from That UFO Podcast. Dan is joining me. He will be moderating the live chat. He's making sure that my audio, Steven's audio, his own audio works. And as well as the, as well as watching the flow and interjecting with questions here and there too. So it's like a collaborative effort. And there's going to be a link once this is posted in the edited version, the final version that will go online to that UFO podcast, as well as Stephen Greer's links in the description too. How, how are you feeling about this, Kurt? Um, I'm nervous. Not any more nervous than any other interview. I'm just a regular amount of apprehension. How about yourself? Yeah, about the same. You know, it, it lets us know that our brains are working properly if we're a little bit nervous at this point, right? It's like going yeah. over the dip on a roller coaster. You know, it's coming. You're prepared. You accept it, but it's nerve wracking yeah. anyway. You're everything okay with you, Dan? Yeah, everything's great at uh, this end. Um, I'm excited. I think we we have some really great questions for for Dr. Greer, and I think people are going to be pleased. Uh, you know, provided that we get to a lot of them anyway. Uh, thank you to everyone that sent them in. We we had far too many um but we can never really have too many as well so yeah thank you um and they were all excellent and a note on that in the future when you're sending in questions for a guest please ensure that they're merely questions for the guest don't type something like kurt can you ask him about so and so because the, firstly that's worded to me like kurt can you ask him and i just want to read it i'm not going to say to Stephen, kurt can you ask him about so and so and also it asks it makes me have to come up with a question like word it so that it's verbatim so that i can read it and then also another tip is to try to make them as short as possible 
think about can it fit in, in a tweet? That's great. Because the longer they are, my eyes gloss over and there's so much background information and there's a backstory and then there's like a preface and then an editor's note to the second edition and I have to edit all of that in my head real time sometimes. So try not to have an, an intemperate amount of an exordium. Please just get straight to the question. Yeah, be con concise and efficient with the time, I think. Uh, pe people don't quite realize how much you have to remember to do as well as talking to your guest, right? So uh, yeah, there's juggling. And w I'm here to help today. And we've got uh, Disclosure Team and Tupacabra and a couple of others moderating the live chat. Uh, thank you to those guys. But yeah, there's still a lot to juggle. So another note is you're allowed to ask tough questions. Like there's nothing wrong with tough questions, just not impolitely questions that have embedded in them assumptions. And well, every question has an assumption, but an odious assumption, just be polite. And it's not the same as being biddable, but be polite. I, I like the, the, the Walt Whitman quote of be curious, not judgmental. Yeah. You know, we, we, we want answers, not reactions. They're, they're very different things. Um, and people are going to be more satisfied if we actually have Dr. Greer answer a lot of questions and fill a lot of the information gaps that we have rather than, you know, just an argument happening on screen, which just isn't, isn't the way. I agree. Who, um, who has been your favorite UFO guest so far, Kurt? Mm. You're not allowed to say me. I don't count. This mm -hmm. isn't guesting. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, Diana Posolka. Oh, great choices. And Sal, why of course, Sal, Sal, Salvador Pius, yeah. So for Diana, I like talking about philosophy. And for Sal, I like talking about physics and math. And okay, so for the audience, again, some notes. Sal is coming up again with Stefan Alexander as a theolocution. That already occurred. I just have to edit it, like put it together and sync the audio and so on. Tim Modlin is out. So Tim Modlin is a philosopher of physics. And if you're interested in interpretations of quantum mechanics, then do watch that episode that's out. I'll put it in the description right now. You can search for Tim Modlin theories of everything, or just search theories of everything is the latest video. Mm. Yuri Geller has confirmed to come on to the podcast. However, I don't know enough of his background yet to see if it's a good fit. I was just inquiring, hey, would you be willing to come on? And I'm not sure if I have enough material to talk with him about. So let me know what you all think. Kevin Knuth will also be coming on soon. Kevin, like, I love Kevin. I asked him, like, hey, do you want to come on? Like, here's the time frame, and here's a couple of topics we can talk about. He sends me in, like, essays upon essays of, <laughs> oh, and here's what my current thinking is on this subject, and, and here's what we could talk about, and I want to talk about so-and-so, but I don't have my thoughts formulated, but here they are in case you want to ask me other questions. I love Kevin. Yeah, he, he really runs headfirst into everything, and he, he has his ideas, but the more I find that people in the wider world, they confuse ideas and the term hypothesis. Um, because a hypothesis is testable, right? It's not just ah, speculation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas Kevin will have hypotheses that he can go and test, and you know he's doing the work for it. So I, I love watching interviews with him. Yeah. As someone here, they they just asked about Dan. Have you ever heard of the Hestalen phenomena? Have you heard about the Hestalen light skirt? But not they, much. But I, I want to know what you think. Yeah, I mean, it's really intriguing. Basically, uh, a bunch of scientists did a study on things that they thought were UFOs. They kind of had to change the language that they use them for it. So we had terms like earth light, so, you know, plasma balls, ball lightning, that kind of stuff talked about. But there was a lot of high strangeness present in the area, and it was almost a, a skinwalker-esque place for a little while. And now there's a 24-7 monitoring station set up. Uh, that doesn't have the highest tech stuff, but it's the kind of place that I wish Brandon Fugel, uh, the guy funding the Skinwalker investigations, would invest in so they could get some better equipment there. But like I say, the, the activity seems to have gone down a little bit, uh, which is strange because you'd think if it was... Sorry, go on, Kurt. Steve has entered the waiting room. 